Bricks and Minifigs is your one-stop shop for all things LEGO. Hit the link below to find a store near you. Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here at Brick World Chicago 2023, and I am back with Stefan and the incredible, epic, new Hashima City collaborative layout here. This is the most mind-blowing LEGO collaborative layout that we have ever covered here on Beyond the Brick, and I can't take wait to take you through all of this, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what we have here? So yeah, you guys are obviously very familiar with the new Hashima project that I started four years ago and have featured it on the channel uh, a lot of times in the past already. Um, but yeah, we have the, uh, I'm not going to say the final iteration, but the vision as far as I had taken it at the time, we've made taken it further already, um, in front of us today. So we are really getting close to the final vision I had for new Hashima. So super happy you guys are here and uh, can't wait to share all the details and uh, interviews with a bunch of the builders too, okay? We are so happy to feature a lot of the talented builders on this. What's a rough number on how many people were involved with so this whole project? We have 80 builders um, who took part of the project that have actual physical builds on the display. 80 different people that have builds here. From seven different countries uh, came for the event this weekend. Uh, of 63 who actually made it to the event, um, so those other 17, they shipped them internationally, they shipped them to friends, they handed them off to people to put in trunks that were coming. Um, and, and so yeah, 80 builders, 63 actual people here at the display to assemble those 80 builders creations. That is incredible. So we can launch on in here with this section right in front of us. Tell us what we've got here. So yeah, this is the um, the second iteration, if you recall, the very first one was only 40 inches by 40 inches and only about three feet high. And that's this corner right here. It was where it all started in uh, Brick Fair, Alabama, 2019. Or 2020, I'm sorry. But, and then it's the 08 base that we saw at Brick Fair, Virginia, the 80 by 80 inch that 11 of us collaborated on then. Um, and, and so this is kind of where it all started. Um, and, but we have um, a bunch of new features in the build. Uh, Ted Andes built this fabulous uh, corporate tower all the way down um, with the billboards on. He really, really pumped it to the max, getting all of the details in this tower right here. And um, we put him front and center in 08 in the original build just because he knocked it out of the park. He was one of the first builders to post whips in our Discord. Um, and in the Discord, I'll mention, actually had over 100 people collaborating. So it's 80 physical builders. It's 100 plus collaborators, digital artists, 3D modelers, uh, you know, respected builders to give critiques um, in, in the effort. So it's a more than 100 person effort to put it together. But yeah, Ted Andy's knocked it out of the park with this new feature um, in Sector 8. Yeah. And this is a good time to mention some of the kind of lights and the billboards, some of the electronic portions of the whole layout that we'll see kind of sprinkled throughout the whole layout here. So what are some of the, the features that you'll see on yeah, those? So, um, a lot of the build, or people who are familiar with the build know that it started out with me and I learned electronics to uh, incorporate specifically into New Hashima. For this effort, we um, were fortunate enough to have Rob from Brick Stuff, um, you know, supporting us through the process. Um, uh, hooking us up with these amazing video screens. Um, and so I would say about 60% of the lights on the display are brick stuff or the brick stuff system, um, which was fabulous because uh, we use the USB as a standard connection on everything um, to make it easier to unplug and plug back in. And, and it was just in designing it around um, USB and incorporating brick stuff system just worked out more perfect than I could have imagined. Um, and, and yeah, you'll see as we walk around, we have hundreds of these screens in, in the layout and thousands of the little lights. But yeah, about 60%. And then a lot of guys, we have some electrical engineers and electric hobbyists um, who did the same thing as, as me and built their own stuff and custom coded microcontrollers and stuff on the display. So it's a real mix, a uh, mash of uh, electronics uh, solutions to get new Hashima up. And a really important part of this build is kind of the layering effect as well. And you, you kind of move up the different levels here. So tell us a little bit about kind of the, the storyline maybe with that and what the each level sort of represents. So as you go around, you'll notice um, there are four distinct sectors. It started with sector eight and we have three new sectors for the uh, display here. And each of them has their own unique story. So uh, Sector 8 is the corporate plaza, which is why you see Ted's uh, fabulous large corporate structure in. And it's where the um, 
corporate ruling class of New Hashima, you know, does their business. Uh, you can see the uh, NATO troops are suppressing a riot. The New Hashima uh, citizens, as you're familiar, can get a little rowdy every once in a while. And so we have uh, the NATO troops from Carter shutting down the riot and keeping the corporate plaza safe. And I'll let the individual builders tell you the story behind their sectors. But yeah, each, each sector has its own unique story and feel, um, it, but it all matching the central aesthetic of cyberpunk. Fantastic. So we've seen uh, the big building here. What else is in this section? Yeah, so this is my new building for uh, the display. Uh, a lot of my work was building tables, planning infrastructure, planning the connections between the sectors. But I did have time to build one new uh, tower right here. Uh, uh, and I'm extremely proud. It honestly might be my favorite build that I've created so far, but uh, a apartment structure in a Hong Kong style um, that I'm very proud of. So yeah, uh, I, I really wanted to capture that Kowloon walled city, uh, Hong Kong uh, aesthetic in the build with the uh, way the high rise apartments with uh, balconies, clothes lines, little shops built in, um, and I couldn't be more happy with how, how that turned out. Yeah. No, I love those little details like the, the legs and the torsos here kind of hanging off the side is such a great feature. Then of course the little kind of kiosks and stuff, all, selling all sorts of things. Yeah, it's, we have uh, the best of the best builders in the world. I mean, seven different countries represented here who are physically here at the event. And, and we were looking for those people who have that attention from fine detail, who are, were going to put 100% 100% into the build and match the intensity that the project just has over the course of its lifetime. So it, it's, uh, I couldn't be more pleased with all the details we packed in there, and we're gonna see a lot more. And we start to see the beginning of a monorail track here as well. Does that run throughout the whole thing? The monorail loops into uh, inner city. Um, it's the Masao Hadaka monorail system um, uh, who pioneered this brick-built monorail, which we've mentioned before. Uh, a phenomenal uh, member of the community. Um, I hope he sees some videos, because I haven't actually talked to him personally, but um, we've incorporated his system, and it's just worked uh, flawlessly for the weekend and over the project's life. Incredible stuff here, so we can keep making our way around then. So yeah, the other uh, build of mine is, uh, and you might recognize it from previous layouts, the 08 uh, Mega uh, building. Uh, popular um, trope in cyberpunk media are huge mega structures where like thousands of people live, almost self-contained cities within a city um, to deal with overpopulation. Um, so I've built this as an ode to uh, Judge Dredd, Cyberpunk 2077, um, any of those classic cyberpunk um, films that, that incorporate that mega structure theme into, into the build. So this is my ode to that. And when we look inside this section, you start to see more of the conflict that you were mentioning yeah. earlier. You start yeah. to see kind of the, the inner part of the river here. Yeah, so again, um, it was important to me. Uh, I, I really am a castle builder. That's how I started building. And I always like to build castles that were organically shaped, like uh, German-style castles that were built into the hills and built organically with the landscape. So when I first started thinking of a project, I wanted to incorporate that experience from ca my castle building days into New Hashima. So I, I decided on this layout with the roads at irregular angles. It's also something you'd see in in most um, Asian cities like Hong Kong, the, the cities developed really organically and so you would see um, things like that, roads that just are, are kind of built matching the terrain uh, around them. No, oh, and it's a fantastic effect and even like the bridge going over and you see there's action underneath there with the red lights and everything as well. So even outside of just these massive incredible buildings, once you start to look inside kind of the middle of each section, there's so much to take in. Yeah. I, I, it, it, that's right. There's just so many angles to this. I mean, there were so many angles when it was just this. So we, it, I haven't even had a chance to take it all in. It would be impossible over the weekend to take it all in, but um, just couldn't be more thrilled. Also, I'll point out the Nakagin Tower um, build that's set, sitting there. It's always sitting right there. This is my favorite angle of the 08 section, looking deep into the city. And I'm so happy to have the Nakagin Tower that was sadly demolished, a travesty, uh, but here still represented in Lego form and preserved. Yeah. Very unique architecture there, looks fantastic as well. 
So as we start around the corner, what else do we have here? So we're getting into the second sector of the city. This is sector two, inner city. It's where all of the um, the outer sections intersect and it, we have uh, the really tall structures. So in inner city, the vibe of inner city is where the wealthy lived and have uh, picked their spot out to be the highest and um, peering down on the, the lower classes that uh, reside within New Hashima. And that's the inner city is is uh, just the meeting point of the whole the whole city that where all of the lives intersect that are living within New Hashima. And we have right here, I'm going to pass off to a fabulous builder, the tallest uh, tower in inner city. Uh, ben Brixen is going to come in and talk about his tower. Awesome. Thank you so much. So take us through what we've got here. Yeah, definitely. So I feel like in Cyberpunk, there's a whole lot of, obviously it's overpopulation at this point. And so rather than actual individual homes, you get these tiny pods, living containers you see, if not in an apartment. So rather than filling out a cube, I decided to try to work inwards, kind of haul out the cube structure and create this superstructures below that. So you've got this hexagonal diagrid going up and then modules starting to get plugged in. And obviously space for more is that the congestion just increases within the cyberpunk world. Below that, you've got little bits of park space, of course, trying to get some kind of green, obviously not like green space, but pockets of that throughout the city. All sorts of stalls, vendors, people selling stuff, vehicles passing through, all sorts of action happening. And aside from just the living, you've got places like ramen shops, noodle shops, sports balls, which is a really big ball attraction, of course. Ikea little furniture, nods to that, which is fun. Even old representations to like a historic Buddha head you've got here drone repair, and then obviously path from trains going into docks. And with these super tall towers you've got, just more moments stuck in. You can see up in the tower here I've got, it's a very congested apartment, and the goal for that was to have a very thin core, but then how can you extend out and get these big moments of massive apartment livings, go back to like the mechanical space with AC units, fans, all that kind of stuff, another apartment unit, just a living block. And then, of course, radio towers galore, because that's really what just highlights the skyline throughout the city. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that core, because what I'm seeing here is some pretty small posts that look like they're holding up a ton of Lego. Yeah, so definitely. I'm sure there there's some risk taking there. Yeah, there definitely was. So we know the cube structure, it's a pretty strong module. It's been in the community for years, of course. And so in this, all that support happens in the outer columns. Coming up to the moment right here, it was trying to create a raft, essentially, a structural raft inside of that first base plate that then feeds to the core. Going back up, essentially once you get to this point, then that core, those columns carry up through there, which are brick boat columns stacked up. So you've got bricks stacked the entire length of this inside of that, while then all the faces and facades of that just extend and cantilever out past it a bit. But this is definitely the moment where it's obviously could be the weakest. But these cubes, they're just so great in compression that, as you can see, we've been able to stack a lot of weight on these and just go really high up. Yeah. So. And these pods that you have in here are such a unique design, and I love kind of the lattice work of the, the yellow structures there. So do those just kind of sit in there? How are those attached? Yeah, so if you zoom in there, you can see the two nodes on either side, directly left and right of each hexa hexagon. And the pods connect directly into those and then hover in that the hexagon profile, actually. There's a very tight clearance, but they do slide through and then pin right into the side. So they are totally suspended inside of each of those moments. And as you can see, little little bits of housing or action happening inside the cubes on there. Others are just lit up where they're not as visible from the public, but then all sorts of action that you get to see through this kind of hollow structure to shops and moments beyond, various markets, all that kind of stuff. So it gives it a hollowness that you can kind of see on and give more depth to the actual city. And what are some of the, the decorative details as we get towards the top of these towers here? Of course, there's lighting and screens throughout, which is always amazing. What are some of the other brick built elements there? Yeah, definitely. So at the first level, you've got two entrances opposite side, the left and right there under those headlamps. And then little bar there, you know, there's bars, stalls, kind of all over, various places people can stop, have a drink, some food. And as you go up, you get the apartment modules, or sorry, not apartment modules, each level with very compact windows. And of course, AC units hanging off of it because even though it's high luxury inner city, of course, how luxurious can that really be? And it's this in a world like this. Still very nice, of course, but as that goes up, you see screens with wires hanging off, all sorts of radios, antennas, trying to get that work and all electronics that are so stuck on after the fact, because this is a world where building just happens upon building in it. And as you move up, you've got some of the venting, AC ducts, huge vents for the building to keep some fresh air, and it mainly for the mechanical core, which are the two fans you see there. 
Then going up, of course, you've got more signage, just advertising everything in here. And each tower really trying to just stand on its own, say, hey, look at me kind of thing. So there's flashing lights, all sort of lit up moments on this. Again, the AC units, it's just a popular theme, so they're all over the city. And then going up to the radio towers, which you see, you need that electronic connection to the whole world. And so that really helps just wire through each portion. Yeah. And through the hollowness of that, you get down, get to look down these alleys and see little shops, conventions, or shops, jukeboxes, conventions, all kind of little bits around. And so as you get close into this, you get these little moments and just sight lines. So the closer you get, the more you can see. There's so many details on each face of these cubes. I'm sure Stefan mentioned, but then as you look down, you can really see what's going on through these sight lines that might not be visible at first. But the more you stand in this kind of area, the more you'll really get to see and immerse yourself in the world here. And that's what makes this so incredible. So thank you. It's really amazing to see all the work that you've put in here. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Simon over here in the dock section. Okay, fantastic. We'll keep moving through here then. All right. So this is sector six, the dock section. The whole part of the dock section we decided was, well, not every builder is a sci-fi or, or like a cyberpunk vibe, grimy builder. There's a lot of like sci-fi builders that we wanted to bring in. So the concept of a industrial spaceport was the original concept for the dock. So um, how all of this was constructed was using these cubes. So this is like an example cube where basically this is the same technology that Forrest King developed 10 years ago, which is a standardized cube, which everything stacks. You can look in the old city, you can look at every section. This is the thing that makes this all work. There is approximately, and I need to recount, 112 cubes within docks alone, not including the toppers. Um, That's just the one section of the docks this, here. This section. I haven't been able to count. I can't count that high for the rest. But um, so all the force goes down these beams. This is what's able to um, make this whole thing work. Uh, we were very afraid of Simon's Tower up there because it sits on six of these things. We t did a somewhat of a test fit without it completed and, and like in the lobby and um, that was a bit scary. Um, but we, 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 we got it done. So if you can take a second real quick and maybe uh, with this cube, take us through a little more of the structure. What is it that kind of gives us the strength that's able to hold all that weight? Right. It's really the way it's designed. It's hard to see, but there's a quarter plate offset between the top of the cube and um, this one by 16 bar. Why it's so strong is because each one stacks on top of the one by 16. So instead of the bricks going down or like some snot, it's going vertically through and all the weight goes right through the pillar. So it's like similar to real buildings. If you think about it, you have those giant um, pillars that are typically within the building that f holds everything up. And this is the same concept. So the, the middle may or may not be that strong, but it's all the weight goes through there. So when we were building or testing Simon's Cube, we realized actually the weight wasn't properly distributed. So we had to reinforce a, a yawn, um, had to get a whole bunch of bricks on site and reinforce the toppest cube right under uh, Simon's Cubes to ensure that it was strong enough. Perfect. No, thank you. That's a great explanation. Better understanding there of kind of how this is all staying together, not just falling apart. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> it, it is a bit wobbly, and we had to do some on-site reinforcement just because um, LEGO has tolerances. And as we were actually putting up, at one point we thought, oh, we're off by a stud, which was like panicking because there is a train inside. But if we're off by stud, we, it, it won't work. We, had, we, ripped up, we ripped up a whole part of the layout trying to fix it and realized it actually was nothing more than the tolerances. But like each Lego brick has a bit of a tolerance. But when you add up this scale, that tolerance becomes very big. Like the, if you were to stack one by one plates versus a one by one brick, eventually you get like a plate offset when you get to like 20 or 30. But imagine this is several feet of it. Um, so how did we actually come up with this concept? So we, we, we knew we wanted to do a, something to get the sci-fi builders in, but what I actually ended up doing after Brick Fair Virginia was I built this. This was my original concept mock that I kind of just put together thinking about what this thing will look like. And this actually is the actual model that I've been kicking around because the, I had this idea, like we have a giant spreadsheet that says each layer who does what, but it's hard to visualize, and I want everyone to visualize it. So like the, if you actually look, um, you can see that the original design called for two pillars. 
so that we can see more on the inside. But because we got so many people, we actually added a third pillar and dropped it slightly more. Well, you, um, and each one of these uh, studs represents 16 by 16 studs. So it's a one to 16 model of this. But you can see that the, the wall in the back was there, the slopes, the landing pads for the ship, the crane, and then the tower, and the landing pad on top, which I can't see because I'm not that tall. Um, it actually all like made it, like the, the original concept, we executed it, there's a couple of changes, for the most part, this entire thing, um, we, 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 we were able to actually complete. You know it's a serious project when you're building a mock to play in a mock. Yes, <laughs> yes, I know, I know. But, um, all right, so let's get into the actual um, build itself. So the water level, um, so you can see the nice cracks and stuff, that was done by uh, Ryan. Um, he asked what he can help. Um, the bro that he is, he was like, the, give me anything. And like the, that, it's everyone is extremely important to put in their job. This lowest section here, this was done by Connor Lil. Uh, he just kind of designed the, the walkway, even though like I had a, the idea of it, but he was like the, I want to do like, can I do like three tall? It's like, no, we, we don't want someone to take that much real estate, but I guess you could do three wide. And not only that, like if you notice some of the other sections, there's walkways between it. He's like the, so if I take the bottom, can I just like spread out? So he, he, he did, all of that and it's absolutely fantastic. He also redesigned the lower pillars. If you notice, they're much thicker than the other ones because he was concerned about that. And at first I was like, ah, oh, it's not gonna look good. And then he's like, I'm gonna build it and prove you wrong. Um, he did and it looks great. So even on the other side, you'll see that the lowest section has the beef up Connor um, section. The next layer is actually also built by one individual, um, Caleb Wagner and the the original idea was, oh, it's going to be a lot of food shops or something, but it was a, a section that I thought to tie it together. Um, on the original model, you can see it was actually one of the gray strips was there. So there's the food court, there's a police check station, and then there's a um, sewer break with some weird monkey um, action um, going on. And we've got that screen right there, kind of right in the middle of it. So do, do each of these screens here kind of switch stuff out throughout the day? How does that work? Um, so they, they're all on loops. So there's an onboard memory pack. So like this is a good point, time to point out that uh, Brick Stuff sponsored and gave, basically, he's like, I have these screens. Who wants one? So like the, everyone just signed up. Um, and he has done so much for us. Like the, he is one of the few uh, sponsors that we have. We got him a jersey. He's our fixer. He's an 01. Um, but like a lot of the lights is brick stuff. All most of the screens are him. And we just had people. We had a channel on Discord of just making ads. Like um, we just a lot of it is really funny. Um, and we actually even reached out to Gad, um, which is a, a digital builder. Um, to ask him to specifically do something. So he, uh, in but Stud IO, he actually designed a animation, animated it, blended it, and then you can see it. It's one of them is the classic Ikira scene with the um, the geisha eating the thing, and then there's the other one which is from Cyberpunk um, seventy seven. And he actually did so like that. That's why I love this collaboration because we got anyone and everyone, and like even the thought of oh, we need a digital guy to help do that. I didn't think about it, but we should have gotten some uh, um, stop motion animators to do a couple of things to throw on to the, the, the area. Yeah, because there just isn't enough going on here. Not I think enough. <laughs> Not enough. We need more, more. That, that, that was the motto of the, there's no expense, no idea that's too crazy. So moving along to the third level now, the first one to the left, um, Aiden built this. It's a bit of a kind of ritzy area within the docks. Um, Much fancier looking than a lot of the other stuff we see here. Yes, because uh, the that's a affluent business club. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, the second one is Chris Roberts. Um, this one is fun because he actually flew with it, so it completely packed down um, to nothing. Um, at one point, we, we, we decided early on we wanted a roadway system to connect to the inner city. So if you can peek very hard in the back, uh, all the roads that I built and all the vehicles, you can't even really see. But here, the, like, the, the, again, it's the, every angle is supposed to look good. So there is a lot of stuff that 
you can't really see it's there, but we built it anyways. But it makes the whole thing much more immersive because if you didn't have that, you'd be looking through and be like, oh, well, it's not finished in there or something. And it would really kind of, I think, take away from the whole build. So it's great that you had that extra attention to detail. Right. Um, Chris also hand wired and solder a lot of this components. So instead of brick stuff, the easy to use, plug and play, um, it's custom program, custom everything. Similar to Stefan and a couple of folks, they took the harder or the, the appropriate route versus some of us taking the easier route. Um, the next one on the end here is Dan Church. Um, so he's if you've seen it from other Beyond the Bricks videos, he's a roller coaster guy. Like he loves using those roller coaster pieces. So like the, he had to slip that in there, uh, despite our standard being um, somewhat square. And it's another uh, delivery service, um, given that this is, again, the whole docks. Uh, moving up to the next level, uh, unfortunately, the chain broke. But one of the coolest things in the display was this elevator. It's uh, inspired by the elevator in uh, Akira. And that's uh, Brendan. And Brendan, I got a good shout out that he drove from California. So we had a couple of Californians that never been to Chicago, wanted to come back. And Brendan Mora was like, OK, uh, I'll drive. Give me everything. So like the um, Scotty, Andrew Lee, um, uh, Jeff Cross, um, a bunch of um, people, and, and they actually broke out some of the old vehicles they had from like some of the Keith Goldman displays that they had kicking around, and they they retrofitted them to be even more cyberpunky to put somewhere in that. And like Brendan, he drove out, and like he was the meal that got there. And again, it goes back to the people went all out to do this. Like the we we call it Yono. You only knew Hashima once, and Everyone just went um, to insane lengths um, to get where we are. So on the uh, fourth level, in the middle here, we have um, Ted Andes um, with the Dock Cider Brewery. Um, so of course, there's got to be like moonshine kicking around this industrial, all this like um, uh, vats and things like that. So like they, they needed a break. You have a brewery on site, which is really nice. Um, Ted actually is interesting. There are two people that I can think of that I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that actually built for all three sections. Most people took one section and focused on that. Uh, Ted is the exception that he built a um, brewery on the dock side, and then you'll see where his other builds are on the um, later. And then if you look on the last one on the end, uh, that's the Dan Lechek's, uh build. And... Um, I really like the uh, part specifically on the other side where you got the maintenance mech doing some work on the thing um, on, on the side of the wall. Um, and it's like, it's also like a, you can kind of tell we kind of, the, the closer it is to the city, it's kind of nicer. So this is like a really nicer um, uh, uh, diner for food um, to do that. And then moving up to the next section, um, this is Blake's. Um, chunk and Blake we'll talk to in a bit but like he was the hardest person to start off like he, he was like gung-ho and he just went non-stop for a year and he the, the techniques that he put and like he, he set the bar because uh, Ted and Blake were kind of like the first ones to go and everyone's like okay this is the standard this is the level we have to get to and his is still some of the best stuff um, and then the next one is Josh Papalini. Josh isn't here, unfortunately, but he shipped his out, and he is the second person to build for all three, i.e., he shipped it out from, um, even though he's not going to get here, but he has been, he's like basically our, 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 a bit of our um, clown in the, the Discord. He's the funniest one, um, but he also works at a Brinklink store, and he was helping us fulfill stuff. Like the, at one point, he um, made a deal to get us a bunch of bricks to try to help that. And like the, he is a superstar, and like the, his builds are phenomenal, and even better, funnier comedian. What, what is this piece here that he uses kind of the ah, gate there? So, so overall, the entire group had a what are the coolest pieces that shouldn't be used um, for things. Those are Scala vent or Scala 
uh, oven vents, I think, like the, the or, or stove stove pieces yeah. that are fit up for fences. It's also old gray, which is like a slightly different color. So like rare colors, I we actually think that we have used every single color Lego has produced somewhere on here. As again, uh, no um, expense is um, spared. Spared. Thank you. So uh, I think I'm going to pass it on to Blake uh, to talk about his chump chunks. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, we got Blake here. So, what can you tell us about your contribution? So, uh, my first contribution was the train um, running through there. Uh, I don't know what compelled me to build a train. I'm I'm not a train guy. Um, I've never built a train before. Uh, one of the advantages of that is that I broke every single rule of train building. Um, it's a huge, huge train, and I, I started off. I know that, like they're t they tend to be about like six studs wide. Um, that one varies anywhere from, um, I forget, it might be more than 10 in places. Um, so the cars are huge. Um, I'm going to actually try to pull one out of here in a second. I just have to um, wait for it. you got to time it right here. <laughs> yep. I, um, I've got the uh, controller down here, so just when it comes around. Um, actually, I can just make it go a little faster so I can get the car that I want here. And there we go. Um, yeah, so I'm pulling a couple out of here. Just bear with me for one minute. Um, yeah, so these things are huge. Um, I don't know if you can quite get the scale of it, but uh, if you look at the bottom, right, it's uh, so long, um, it doesn't even fit on a normal train base. The wheels can't make the turn. Um, weighs about two pounds. Notice that it has two 9-volt motors under here because... Um, I, I tried being, you know, not a train guy again. Um, I built it and I figured, you know, a 9-volt motor, no problem. But it, um, with only two cars, one would just, like, die after about a minute of running. Um, so it, it's running seven of them now. Um, these are the back two cars, so they each have two. And it's just the, the weight, it's just from all the angles and everything. I like doing, you know, crazy offsets and, you know, no two studs with uh, lining up. Um, and so that just adds a lot of brick to hold it together, and so they're incredibly heavy. Um, they certainly look, they look very chunky here, so you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so then I had to engineer it into actually moving. I was a little bit worried about it, but I had to get a, um, it's a 100-watt power supply, because the thing pulls about two or three amps when it's running. Um, but it, it's worked. It's been going for the whole con, and, you know, it hasn't stalled. Fantastic. Tell us more about the design on this one on the right here and what kind of what this contraption is. Yeah, so I, um, I owe uh, Ted Andes uh, the um, credit for suggesting I do something robotic. Um, what I, I actually started, uh, I, I guess I thought of the concept when I was going to make a hopper car. Um, that tended to, uh, uh, that went to the, sorry, <clears throat> that went in a very different direction than I was planning originally. Um, I unfortunately don't remember the name of the artist, but there was a concept artist who, uh, whose um, sketch I used uh, to kind of base it to, uh, the design for this one on. But then this is more what I was thinking when I was originally planning the hopper car. But then I thought, you know, two hopper cars might be, you know, a bit much. And so I put a big robot arm on top of what was kind of going to be the original platform. No, and it looks incredible there. And I like your, your color choices here as well. So using some unique colors as well that blend together maybe some rarer stuff too. Yeah, I had to get a lot of new, new colors for this. I had to buy, I mean, I had almost no uh, dark orange. And, you know, it's a tricky color to work with just because of like I didn't have many parts. Um, my entire collection of dark orange was on the floor when I was working on it. So I know you mentioned that you hadn't done much train building before. Has it been running smoothly for you? Is your kind of end product what you wanted? Yeah, yeah, it hasn't stopped at all. Um, you know, it took some electrical engineering, like you know, to get the even to get the voltage to be even on the track. Um, but yeah, it's, I've been very happy with how it's run. It's really had no issues. Hasn't even um, come apart. You know, it's been it's been working great. And something that's really cool here, and I don't know how easy it is to show, but you can see the train cars as they go by through these different sections. And so you really get kind of that immersive feeling as you see the train go behind all the different cubes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we kind of, we didn't want the whole thing to show at once because the train is, um, it's almost half the length of the track loop it's running on. Um, 
and that would just look kind of weird. And so you kind of get more the impression that there's a train running in the background, and you know it's ambiguous where the track actually is even going. I built a giant train layout because his train was so cool. It was very <laughs> annoying because it is very wide. We had very specific turning radiuses that is much wider than a normal Lego train, which meant we had to redesign an entire section, both sides, of the, both the tail ends for the curves, because it couldn't turn in a normal space. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, um, even though it's like 10 studs wide, it, I mean, it's so long, it carves out, you know, 12 studs um, going around those corners. Well, that's fantastic. It's great to hear more about kind of the, the inner workings of the train and some of the inside stuff there. So thank you so much. Do you, do you have other sections here as well? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to put down my train cars here for one second so I can, uh, I can point to it. Just bear with me here. I'm not going to put them back on the track right now because that's a bit of a pain. Um, so after, after I was done with the train, I decided I was going to build some cubes. Uh, the first one right here is uh, um, Bot Mart. That's actually the second one I built, but that's the closest one to us. Um, this was sort of a, a meta collab within the collab, um, because like, you notice there's a strut in front of here under the landing pad. Um, there are four of them total. Um, when you guys get to the other side, you'll see the others. Um, and when I, when I started that, uh, I wasn't actually planning on having it being part of the infrastructure. It was just going to be some sort of cool projection. It wasn't even going to be on the front of my cube. It was going to be on the side. But then, like, it just sort of evolved to look like a strut. And so, you know, I talked to Alec, who built the, um, the whole top layer of the docks, and we decided we were going to try to integrate um, his landing pads into the strut. Uh, and it's actually functional because, the, you know, those pads have some weight to them. And the, the struts are pretty sturdy. Um, so they're actually holding the thing up. They're functional. And we also just thought it would look cool because it ties the uh, top level down to the uh, cube structure below. Um, and then uh, I, at least we were fortunate enough to think of the idea of integrating them early enough that I was able to make a digital model of it as I kept going because there are four struts, I built two of them and, um, and then I handed the digital model off to other builders with the uh, instruction to take creative liberties with them. Like if you'll notice, no two are quite the same, even mine are, are a little bit different. No, absolutely fantastic. I love it. Great work there. Thank you. And I think we'll come back to Simon now then. Yeah, so um, we're now moving into the furthest spacey spaceport section where as part of original design, we had basically three spaceships that we wanted to build. So this was like the, who can I get to build the spaceship? And um, I think it's a good time to point out that we really tried to get as many builders as we want. So I would say we, we put out feelers. I, specifically invites as well as the open invite hey if you're going to Chicago or even not or like please join this thing um, so my attempt to uh, try to accumulate as many lugs as possible I had tried to get someone from Eurobrix to build one of the ships um, he unfortunately couldn't so I ended up producing this during September um, again going back to the this is the craziest thing we'll ever do uh, the Maersk ship is actually Maersk blue which as some of the viewers might know it's not exactly a cheap color um, in fact the it is very expensive and um, it's this collaborative nature of stuff like there's many people that sent other people parts where they didn't like the cubes as you saw before not a lot of people have all those 1x16s in the specific color did um, I, you notice in the docks it was a gray structure in all the other sections is block structure but like a lot of builders don't even have that but um what happened was um alec Doty, he sent me all his mirsk so that i can do this um so you get that that yeah. sharing aspect along with the collaboration right. as well right right and, and this is where kind of where we also wanted to celebrate a lot of this and one of the things we decided to do is we wanted like shirts or, or like a, a uniform so we designed um kevin wise actually suggested oh let's do a esports jersey so like the i designed th this so that we all look really cool and you can see the different lugs and the actual sponsors kicking around that of the different groups that actually uh, partake and they're all um, customized for everyone's names. So in the back, you can see the the my name, my real name, and some of other lugs that 
like partaked and like the if you notice all over the weekend you can spot us a mile away and it's funny because I think of the 80 odd builders 40 of them bought jersey no no 45 of them and some like the oh they weren't here or they oh it didn't like they didn't look very good on the picture and then now everyone's like okay we're gonna do a second order because everyone wants the jersey to keep so moving on to the dock section another prominent feature that if you saw in the model is the um, the slopes. The slopes are interesting because they were um, partially designed digitally by the other Simon. So um, I was tickled pink that there's another Simon and the concept of Simon's collabing I thought was really, really funny. So he designed like the, if you look on this one, he kind of designed the, this slice of the slope based off of my thoughts and then I flushed in the rest. So like the, this is another thing where Rarely have I ever seen people collaborate on the same portion of a build. Usually it's the, I built one side, you build the other side. But it was really the, here's a digital file. Uh, I think Blake talked about the crates and how we customized his concept. And this kind of working together is something that I have never really seen. Um, just bringing this out in a whole collaborative nature. We're reaching peak Simon here. It's, yeah. it's, it's a little scary. Yes, um, and moving on, so the, the, the other prominent feature in the model was the crane. So we had Marcus build this crane over here, and then I'll show you mine um, in a second. Um, so a lot of the, the other prominent feature that was on the model was also the landing pads. So if you want to take a closer look at this one, um, this was designed by um, Zach. Zach took it on to him to like, I'm gonna build this. It's gonna have lights, it's all wired. You can actually see probably on Adrian's ship a bit better that it's hired, uh, hooked in and wired so that you can drop USB straight down as well as it's got the custom lights as well as the paneled lights for everyone. And this light uh, during the World of Lights was fantastic. But this was a case where we built it and Adrian kept asking on the bigger ship, which you'll see, is it gonna hold the weight? Because the, they're, they're, the it, it's very heavy, um, and the way Adrian builds, it's a solid chunk. Versus at least a lot of the, the cargo containers and or sorry, the, sorry, the, the cubes, they're semi hollow, or at least it, it's facades and such. But the we, we tested it, it, it's fine. I also want to give a shout out to this piece back here. I think is that one of the the Mars kind of tubes there? Yes. Um, so we like again, we love fancy piece usage so it's and it's a shame that we spent so much time building a lot of these things that are completely hidden but we know it's there it adds that level of detail and depth to everything um, so the other thing that we actually did was like we had a couple of build parties where um, we got together and like mass produced some things mass producing the cargo containers was one of the things we did um, for the for, for this like the, we went to the house we brought I brought a lot of pieces we watched Shrek for some reason and if you actually if you actually come over here there's a Easter egg and you can see there is a Shrek cargo container hidden in there um, so at one point we were basically trying to figure out how many cubes per Shrek movie could you make uh, I, I was by far the, the fastest, but I was also making the more simplest one. So like uh, Sean Mayo, uh, Kevin Wise, Michael Biederman, who is very nice to host us. Um, we did a Shrek watch marathon. Uh, we almost got to Puss in Boots, but we didn't get that far. And we're just cranking them out um, all over the weekend. So the next sector in section here is this front area was Kyle Vermees. So Kyle is um, one of the three original Brolug builders from 10 years ago that was here. He's been kind of out of the community for like five, six years. But when he reached out, he's like the, yes, I will come. I'll have to redo that. So like the, he um, built Kind of, he came in kind of late, so like the, we already kind of set where everyone and who's gonna do what, and like, okay, I, 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 we gotta find a place for Kyle. So we basically, if you notice, we actually raised this a whole another level to fit him in, and I had to build the, the back section just so it kind of worked. Um, but then I think I'm gonna actually hand it off to uh, Casey McCoy, who's gonna talk about the Octang 
uh, tower. Yes. Yeah, this little thing we've got in front of us here. So, Casey, great to see you. Tell us about what you brought here. Yeah, good to see you as well. Thanks for being here. So I'm Casey. I'm a builder from Chicago. This is Octan Tower. Starting from the base where you see the Octan logo, I build everything starting from there and upward. Uh, the tower is about four and a half feet without the antenna. It's about six and a half feet with the antenna. It's kind of a little cheating. I, you know, everybody in this collab thought that they were going to have the tallest tower, then come to find out that Simon blew us all out of the water. We'll get, we'll get that. We'll get to that. But, um, yeah, I'm super happy with how it came out. This kind of like Blay monstrosity that represents, you know, the dominance of the Octan Corporation in the future. Um, if we kind of just like start with the um, lower sections, right? So out in the front, we kind of have like a corporate um, facade, I suppose, of like hiding all the inner... Um, dealings and crime that they're covering up in New Hashima. So there's kind of like some propaganda and environmental um, propaganda video in the back that's running on an old phone. So I cut up that video together um, and just kind of like a lounge area. There's kind of like a cyber uh, attendee for the desk. If we kind of zoom out to, to this kind of rounded facade, we've got some scripts. Uh, overall in my build with the script, so that should say Octan, apologize, I'm an ignorant American. If something is lost in translation, I'm so sorry. But um, that's kind of like the base of the tower. If we wrap around the back, it's just dock doors pretty much for, you know, receiving in crates, processing, you know, any kind of shipments that the Octan Corporation may have and things like that. So the tower itself is based off of Taipei 101, the tower, which knowing you guys, you've probably literally been in. Uh, not yet, but uh, I'm, fam I'm familiar with it. Very, very nice. I'll give it time. This is the preamble for you guys. So um, Taipei 101 kind of has this like design where it um, fans out and then recesses with all these repeating floors. I don't have 101 floors, unfortunately, like them. Nor do I think they have 101 recessions, obviously. But I try to take after like a real-world uh, Asian-inspired architecture design when, when planning it effectively. So it has kind of some repeating floors first. Those are like corporate offices, right? We've got our Octan corporate soldiers that are kind of protecting the well-guarded information of the Octan Corporation. So kind of in the lore, this building does like corporate offices. It does fuel processing. We'll get to that as we go further up you know, like shipping and receiving, and it also does air traffic control. We'll get back to that when we go further up. So next up is kind of like the most prominent feature of the tower, which is this giant Octan logo. It's, a, <coughs> excuse me, about 48 by 48. My voice is a little shot because I was screaming my head off at the Fold concert yesterday at Brickworld. So Octan logo, again, it has that same repeated script that should say Octan. We move over here to the right hand side. This is kind of an example of like all the fuel processing and whatnot. So in my mind, there's um, like liquid fuel processing over on that left side, along with airlines and water lines and things like that. There's kind of like an oxidizer on the top that uses some James Bond uh, Speed Champions printed pieces. Really happy with how that turned out. There's some you know dock workers uh, working around. One of the most cool things about this collab is how well integrated everyone's kind of ideas were and whatnot. So you'll see that especially with Sightown and Zach's cubes, which are coming later uh, with this section of the docks. But some like small things that I was able to incorporate is like um, Blay Junkie Luke, his dog is kind of um, the one that he gifted me is kind of down here on the bottom there. So we've got that dog incorporated. Uh, my buddy Dan uh, Leshik, who made a cube, he has this repair drone on the side of one of his cubes. I've got that same repair drone being uh, repaired by one of the dock workers. My other buddy, Michael Higgins, he made these advertising blimps. That's also in the next facade, but I've got one on the very top up there uh, as well. That's got an Octana advertisement. So it's so cool how people have, you know, like without you know even intentionality just see something cool posted in the discord it's like that's so awesome i want to integrate that and that kind of like adds to the story and the lore of like how well connected everything is because in theory this could be extremely disparate but it's kind of crazy how well it all blends together when we put it all together so um if we come back around to the other side and you see this kind of like massive el wire sign again that should should say shipping and it says it on both sides that was really technically challenging. The internal of it, so the two facades of the two sides is about three bricks across, and then there's a um, half plate bevel that surrounds it. 
Um, so I had to cram all the EL wire into basically a one brick frame and then also run 32 long uh, axles, Technic axles, through them to try and support it and then attach it and suspend it mid-air. Uh, there was a lot of sagging at first before I just bit the bullet and just bought 32 uh, axles pretty much. Um, so we're very pleased with the flower sets for making those massively available. If we turn around to the other kind of like fuel processing side, so Hashima Island was a mining colony effectively uh, that kind of reached its heydays, I want to say in like the 70s or 80s. It's abandoned now and whatnot. I'm sure Stefan has probably gone through the lore and the history better than I can. So I tried to represent something like if Hashima was taken back over, maybe they found more coal. So in my mind, this like uh, tank over here on the right, that's kind of like a you know coal tank or something like that. And they're like scooping it with the crane and whatnot. And then we've got you know more processing and things like that. The greebling was easily like one of the most time intensive parts of making this tower. Um, but I'm really happy with kind of like how the fuel processing component worked. And then if we spin over to the back now, this is probably the other kind of like detailed portion. This is where like the air traffic control happens for the ships. So there's a custom video that I put together that kind of splices uh, both advertisements that were designed by my graphic artist friend Nathaniel. So thank you to Nathaniel for putting those together. He did an awesome job. But then it also um, has air traffic, uh, like flight status and things like that. So it has arrivals and departures and things like that. So it has all the names of the ships in the docks, in the correct numbered docks that you see on the build. And it has their names, where they're going, things like that. And then for arrivals, it has like little Easter eggs for the Expanse fans, for those that are fans of The Expanse. Kind of a niche TV show, but we're all, all big fans here. So that's kind of like the screen, the script on the left and the right. If you read it from left down and right down, it should say air traffic control. Should, should. And then in the bottom, you have like the uh, workers who work in air traffic control that are kind of like talking on the monitors and whatnot. So it's so crazy with this display that like people like you can't even see hardly that screen unless you're on the other side but like everything just blends together so well and like you can stare at this for two hours and you'll like still miss details it's it's crazy and incredible so that's like my giga cube in in the in the tower because simon explained to you i think the the cube system so that's 32 by 32 and my base is uh, 64 by 64. But then when you go up and start doing those like recessed and fanning floors, right? Um, that kind of works off of like 50 studs long. So if you double the dimensions in all directions of a 32 by 32 cube, you get like eight times the volume, right? But if you do 50 studs by 50 studs, it's about like four times the volume approximately. So this is my giga cubes, which might be the biggest cube. It's a little, you know, geographically boxy, but it, it turned out okay. And then we just have more repeating floors as we go towards the top. Uh, there's kind of like some industrial AC units. Again, just back to this collab, like people have poured so much detail and heart into soul into things that most people will probably never see. So like even people down here on the floor, I mean, this tower is like probably like nine feet, 10 feet tall or something in the air. No one's gonna see the roof. I said, I don't care. I love this project too much. The roof has to be detailed. So there's like, you know, AC units on the top. We've got like, um, you know, radio antenna, which is crucial for like interstellar communication with other spaceports and things like that, as well as like a giant radio dish as well. So I'm just so thankful to Simon, our sector leader, and all the hard work uh, that he's done, as well as uh, Stefan, who had the brilliant idea to, you know, like revive the Brolug spirit, and he's put so much time and energy. So we're super thankful and grateful for all that was done. So. Happy to be a part of it. It was like truly an honor. So yeah. yeah, awesome, incredible work here. Thanks for taking us through all those details. I'd love to hear kind of your approach to the whole build. So awesome work. I just thought of one last thing, yeah. one last thing. So I also designed the soundtrack for New Hashima. So I, I want to take that opportunity to, to shill that as well. <laughs> so we had um, kind of like early discussions. I'm like a big music fan, right? Especially getting into like synthwave genres, outrun music, things like that, that kind of got kickstarted after the movie Drive. So there's like a big explosion in that kind of like culture and like 80s revivalism of like synth, synth type music. So I, I got really into that into college and 
When I first started, you know, being a part of this display and idea back in like the fall of last year, I built, you know, just like a generic playlist, vibe playlist, but as we were getting closer to the show, I was in a Discord call with Stefan and he was like, hey, we need somebody like who wants to run the music. I was like, please let me run the music. I don't care about the builds. I will just do the music, please. So we have two different playlists. One's like a daytime playlist. This uh, is like the centerpiece is Blade Runner Blues, which is a total classic and what was used at Brick Fair in DC, I believe. So that's kind of like the centerpiece and we use other like movie soundtracks like Blade Runner 2049 and Drive and other kind of like disparate themes. For that, what I wanted to evoke was a like feeling of like mystery and awe and intrigue and reflection and things like that. So there's a lot of like low BPM, uh, Time Cop 1983, uh, in there as well, and that's kind of like what we wanted to evoke. But for the nighttime playlist, I wanted it to be hype. <laughs> so instead, it's like really hard edge, kind of like grit, and that kind of like incorporates like again more like harder nighttime, uh, the midnight tracks. Um, so things particularly from their uh, EP. I forget the name now, of course, but look up the midnight. They're big. They're big. Um, I think it's nocturnal. So yeah, nocturnal the EP. It's like my least favorite track on the EP, so I kind of forget about it. Um, but then also like um, this band, September 87, they're an awesome synthwave band. So we use a lot of their EP from Act One. And like we just got a ton of comments from people who say like the ambiance that was set through the music of like the whole display is just encapsulated in that music. So honestly, I'm more happy of how the music turned out than I am of the actual tower. So. <laughs> I just need. I just Which need is to like saying something when you look at this now. here. That's yeah. incredible. I love the amount of thought that went into something, even like the music, outside of the build itself. It just says so much about kind of the level of effort that everyone put into this here. Yeah. So super happy they <laughs> let me take that over because I'm like a snob when it comes to music too. So so yeah. So awesome. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll Thank come you back sir. over to Simon. Okay. So uh, one thing I should point out that um, again we did we we. No, nothing was too stupid. We, what we decided to do, or someone decided to do, we should be in the layout. So if you're going to zoom in on this particular minifig here, uh, if you turn around and look at Casey, who normally builds monastery, uh, we'll pick it up. Like the, um, so we have an entire channel dedicated to posting pictures of ourselves. And one of the minifig guys, like the Josh, he built all our, like, rep ourselves and hit it in the city. Uh, I believe mine is in some sort of adult club of some sort. Oh, Simon. Uh, I, I, I didn't put it there. They put me in there. But the that, that's, again, another just thing that we all did. Um, like, another one is, if you look, there's all these, like, robot dogs. So that's Luke. Um, he designed all of these, and he put them up for adoption. So there's an actual page or spreadsheet where each one has a bio that like the what's their like their dislikes um, and, and such so like the the we spent an entire night writing bios for each one of these dogs that people adopted so that you can see they are scattered throughout everywhere so looking back now to the layout we this ship here uh, the green one was uh, Zach built. So Zach, if you remember, he built the landing pads and he also designed this amazing ship. Um, I know it's gone through like several iterations, um, but like the, the, the quality here is crazy. Like the, I don't, we didn't want people to build volume. Yes, we have a lot of builders, but we always said focus on your one thing. Um, again, the, the quality level bar set very high. And the again, like the this is where we just look at any level, any section. It's just absolutely fantastic. And and Zach just like the he he he. Uh, if you can see here, this is a good section where you can see that he even included USB ports for us to plug in ships, um, and it, it's easy access, and it's just great. I love this pipe work kind of yeah. running through the ship here. Right, like so like the we talk about greebling and like usually it's messy. Like the its point of it is like I think like if you look at the Star Wars ship, it's all about like this messy just fill in space, but like the it is so aligned. And like I remember talking into a call, um, figuring out what would work, what color would work, like the, the this is the type of project that people know this is going to be like my piece de resistance and everyone just knocked it out of the park trying to get like everything um, as perfect as it can. You can also see that this 
zigzag girder, um, that was an early concept of him. And then we've actually replicated that similar um, angle or, or similar angles and vibes on the slopes because the, in our mind, all of this is um, kind of tied together. It's in the same world. So like the, the borrowing and stealing uh, concepts and stuff from people, um, that's really kind of what this all got together. So I built like a lot of the, the insides. I think my personal account was 72 cubes. They're mainly empty or filled with uh, cargo containers and stuff. But like I got to a point, I think a couple months ago, where I'm so sick of gray. I, I was going to bang my head to the wall because it's gray, 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 gray. Um, but I knew how to build one of the cranes. So um, this is my crane where I just needed some color, anything. So this is like one of my the classic Simon uh, color combos, which is bright light orange and teal. Um, my September ship the last time was the exact same color scheme. So I knew I had the parts and I just needed, like I took the weekend off uh, and I built a crane and it was so nice. I got to use color. Um, but again, it, it's like the, this group effort where I built it. It was completely just bright light orange and teal and like these, the guys were like, Simon, no, it, that, that's too clean, too nice, doesn't work. So then they forced me to add all the orange and then the, some um, uh, dark orange and just, just to get it more weathered so it doesn't stick out too much like a sore thumb, um, which is kind of annoying because I, don't, I sort by color. So if I want like three other colors, I got to bring like three other bins out um, to build all this. So one of the reasons why we decided to dox was to get sci-fi builders. So like one of the best sci-fi builders is Adrian Drake. He is a bit of a size queen and likes really big things. He's done one or two, you know, yeah, medium-sized yeah, builds. Yeah. So and um, he, he built this ship here. And um, as an actual um, rocket scientist, there was a lot of questions on do things make sense. In other words, the Logically, does this make sense that you would build a ship like this to like move things off? It actually doesn't, but that, that kind of goes down to our rule of cool. <laughs> if it looks cool, maybe it doesn't. It's okay that it might not make logical sense because if you think about it, this is probably not the way you would want to actually build a rocket ship, but it looks cool. Um, like, because if you think about the thrust, all the it, really they should be all shipped the other way, but like it, it, it's fine. Um, but it's just another kind of one of those. Um, we just got to do what it is. So like the, actually, if you look at some of the crates, there's some crates that are kind of silly. So um, during one of our crate parties, basically I asked everyone like the, uh, on an Instagram story, give me some color combos or ideas. Um, so one of them, a specific builder that you may or may not have uh, interviewed before, asked for black, purple, um, um, medium azure, and a bit of white. And knowing who it is, I kind of guess exactly what he wanted. So yeah, that, that is Nick Brick's actual logo in crate form. And then possibly one of my favorites was this one, which is <coughs> uh, basically Optimus Prime. Um, actually, no, no, sorry. The Shrek one's still my favorite. It's so silly. We should mention real quick, just to give an idea of the scale, this spaceship alone right here is like six feet tall, probably? Uh, slightly lot. Well, actually, yeah, about six feet. The, the base layer is eight um, inches high. So like the every sector is actually a different uh, level, but they're all permutations of against the cube. So like this is zero. Um, O2 is one cube higher than that. Uh, O3, or inner city, is three cubes up. And then I forget what uh, O8 is, but like the, because if you when you look around like the different height levels um, is pretty great um, that also said despite the docks being the lowest section we also have the highest point which is a great segue into I think actually the tallest member of our collaboration both in the literal sense and physically um, the better Simon <laughs> yeah, I love it. What a, what a great introduction there. So thank you so much. Why don't you tell us about what you've got for us? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Simon over from Germany and I brought that tower with me. And like the, the funny thing is like I just got involved because of your interview from last year because I texted Stefan after that and got involved. So I, I brought that tower with me and I started like with, with each of the modules. So I played around a bit with like the panel piece with the window in front and also like the fender piece from a Technic set and I built the module digitally and then I already had the staircase. It's a design from two years ago 
and I had to tr to find a way to uh, get it all together. And it took took a long long time to like align the walkways with the modules, so every module has a door at the back, and to align everything that all fits together. I mean, that's amazing work, and the fact that you're able to get all of those sort of pods off the central structure there. Well, what did that take to achieve that and make sure that those weren't falling off? So there are like two kinds of, of, of so we call them uh, side blocks, uh, two kinds of connections like by the side, it's with uh, Technic axles, and the other uh, ones with, which have this window pointing forward are connected by Technic lift arms. And that's how I connect them, and I can pull uh, pull them all off to like transport it and to set it up. And what is above that? As you kind of move up the tower there, what are those higher sections there? So it's I, I thought about it would be like an antenna with all the um, technical stuff needed for the towers, like AC and 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 that kind of stuff, and also like an uh, antenna providing um, like connection for the whole city because it's like the highest point. Yeah. And it's crazy that you came from Germany and have the highest section on the tower. So tell us a little bit about kind of the logistics and how you were able to move all that over here. So I had two big suitcases which uh, had the tower in it. And it was like I, I got really lucky because I haven't had the time to, to do a test fit. So I put everything in the night before I flew over. And I, I just got lucky that everything fits in. And so, like how it's built up, we, I have four sections. Um, so, if you are dividing uh, the, the columns, the uh, sand blue ones by four, you have one section. And I could put them up separately with the uh, modules attached on the side. And then after that, I have to uh, to attach the staircase. And pretty much everything of it was like dismantled uh, or like uh, taken apart, like. Every uh, cube was uh, packed separately, and like the staircase was dismantled completely because I didn't have the, the space. And also, like the antenna, it was yeah, so many pieces I had uh, to put together here again. You also have some excellent lettering in this section here as well. Yeah, I I tried my best to like fit the sky, uh, fit the style of the rest with the Japanese um, letters. So on the side it says Saitown, and on the top it says Blocks because we we were thinking about how to call like the, the modules, and yeah, I, I tried my best to 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 fit into the whole style. So now you've had this set up for uh, a, a day or two here at the show now. So how has it been standing up there? Is it very kind of wobbly? Are there any concerns about it coming down at any point? I, I was very nervous since I got here to put it up because I, I knew the height. But standing here, it's a different thing to see how high it actually is. And like the antenna on top is pretty wobbly. Like when someone uh, pushes against it while while we set it up. So we started with this section over here with my tower and then the rest was built around and it, it was wobbling the whole time and we all were, were uh, feared that it would tip over, but it's still standing and yeah, I'm just happy. Just incredible work. Thank you so much for all your effort here. And it's great to hear that you were able to, to see the previous iterations, the previous videos and then get involved. I love to hear that with the collaborative layouts as more and more people join. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. Awesome work, thank you. So we will come back over to Simon again here, I think. Yep. So um, continuing on from down, um, we didn't talk about on the other side, but this top layer, Ad uh, Alec uh, Doty, he was this guy that let me the Maersk blue, but he was just in charge of this entire top section. So like the, um, there's eight total cubes. Um, four on this side, four on that side, as well as the top that, again, Casey mentioned, you can't really see. I'm not that tall, but, like, it is completely gorgeous uh, from there. And Alex, he was in charge of all of this. He lives down in uh, Knoxville, so it's a bit of a drive, and he actually shipped it and spent, like, we got here on Tuesday and spent a lot of time actually just rebuilding that. Uh, him and Luke, which was another earlier um, attendee that came early, helped with the recreation of all of this. But like the, the having this, it really caps the feel of this isn't like a city per se. This is a giant warehouse to give that kind of vibe as well as he designed these um, landing pads. So the landing pads, if you remember from model, was always there. So the little 10 two by twos that we had but as we kind of started doing this concept, we're like, oh, we, we, we need struts, or we need something to hold it up for both 
uh, actual support as well as it looks cool. So like the Blake designed these crazy struts um, and built one and created basically recreated in stud.io digitally so that the other two builders, um, they could recreate and build their own variations of the strut. Again, it gives like the, the concept of this is a uh, functional building and it makes sense because you have to have these components um, in there. Um, so you, you can see that each one is slightly different. So like there's sand green on this side and then that one, like, yeah, it's sand green, but it's got the, um, I think that's Kingdom, Knight's Kingdom, um, Scorpion flag. So all of that, like it, 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 it's a, we want to keep it um, somewhat have a uniform feel, but it, over the age, over the time that this thing must be around, it's kind of like degraded or upgraded or, or, or changed up a bit. I also wanted to point out real quick, this section here is amazing. If you look at these individual lines, almost none of them are the same. So you get different colors and different pieces running down there in almost kind of every column with every little section there. Right. Um, the Because we knew this was going to be eye level, well, actually, we were, it was actually not eye level. It was actually higher than eye level. And then we that's when we decided to, instead of two pillars, we're going to make three to drop it down. Because otherwise, I think the top was 13.1 feet. If we kept the original design, it would be like 14, 15. And like the, um, that is a serious issue in terms of how to put things on from a, a height perspective. Um, so that's when we decided, OK, we, we need to reconfigure everything. We had like a panic Discord call like the when we actually realized we stacked it up because I started building up crates, I stacked up and realized this is high level already and we're supposed to go two more and then put the top on. So we had to completely redistribute things. I think it actually makes more sense because it's more dense, um, which is for me, because I build a lot of the inside, you can't see as much of the stuff I intended to, um, but it's just going to be, it, it worked so much better. So this corner here is also Blake Foster. Like the, so he did so much. He was like one of the first guys out. And again, he set the bar on detail, on the texture, and like the, like the, this, uh, we don't have a best uh, cube trophy or anything, but like it, it's probably some of the best ones because like the, he just spent so much time on it. Um, the one underneath here is Sean Mayo. So keep in mind that we have, um, we're, we're near the water. So like it made a lot of sense to have a fish market going in. And you can see that he did these wonderful um, fish skeletons to go with it, um, as well as the, 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 the inside there. The big sharks hanging down there. That's super cool. Yeah. Like the, again, you got to use all the fun pieces that we can find. Um, then the next section is actually a two high. So Dr. Brahm, another guy from California, um, he did this wonderful refining because again, like the it's a spaceport, they're gonna need fuel uh, for that. There was also like a huge discussion on like what color fuel or liquid do we have? But I don't think we ever actually came to a consensus. But like these are the things you think about is like the in this world, what is fuel to power these hypothetical ships that again don't really make sense, but rule of cool. And then possibly one of the coolest ones afterwards is uh, Zach's cube. So like not only did he do ship the, um, the landing pads, he did this double cube, which if you notice, is actually assembling the side blocks. Um, so stuck better Simon, uh, he, his tower, this is a modular component and he built a factory that you can see is being assembled here. And it's really hard to see on the right side, but that's actually being painted all it so that you can see it comes in white and then it gets painted. And like he's not normally much of a mechanical builder. Uh, Brendan Moore on the other side, the, the sliding elevator, he and him, like Baron is like, I had this idea, how do I do it? And again, it's this kind of um, work men, uh, group work mentality to get the coolest thing ever so that we can um, do this amazing thing. So the next layer down, that's going to be uh, Lee Roberts. So he built this. I, the he was um, a bit busy, but and I was honestly a bit worried. But like he knocked it out. Like the um, and this is actually very interesting. Like the, the group that we got was so good, and it was a very 
difficult time trying to get people to post whips because people like Blake were posting a lot of things. A lot of people were honestly kind of embarrassed or anxious or shy on posting things until they knew that it was good enough. But at the same time, that's the whole point is to post things so that we can work. Like, and this is part of, the, we, we had this conversation of the, we will accept absolutely anyone as long as they agree to post and we can work with it. Because we have the belief that we can turn anyone around to being an amazing builder, post it, will help out, and like the, it turned out absolutely fantastic. And every single one, I'm so proud of everyone. The next one um, is the, the, the uh, Mike Higgins. It's like a blimp delivery system um, in the, in the um, um, that goes around as well as in an arcade. And if you zoom in really closely, uh, oh, the screen was off, but it used to have an actual arcade game uh, for that. So uh, the far left, is going to be uh, uh, this fire station, or sorry, this is another kind of refinery um, chunk where um, it, it's on fire, and um, this is possibly the latest, the the last uh, cube that was created. I know for a fact because it's technically Micah Biederman's cube, but I also know Eli Wilsey and uh, Sean Mayo were heavily, heavily involved in helping him complete this probably yesterday or, or, or the, the day before. Classic Micah right there. You know, what, why build it ahead of time when you can just do it all last minute? You know, it's just easier that way. Well, speaking of last minute, well, I was on a uh, last minute call chatting with folks and um, I realized that we're going to do fire and I'm like, the, oh, I'm going to do a nice fire truck. And um, I know one of the Lego master contestants um, and I, I was like, okay, I, I'm going to build him a little fire truck and give it to him. And Nick Delamora, the season three master, was, oh, why don't we just ask him to do it? So like a week out, if you pan over here, um, Yo-Yo, he built, who is a fire truck or a fireman in real life, he built a, knocked us a giant fire truck. And then I only saw like pictures of it in like a, a, a Vanish uh, Instagram style thing. So like the... I was like, okay, I kind of remember. So I built him the chief truck that's sitting right in front of that. So that's like the last minute um, things that we, we kind of did. So a lot of it was very well planned, but a lot of it was also um, last, very last minute. So moving down to the next sector, uh, we have um, Caleb again. So Caleb Wagner did the entire thing um, and this whole this whole section right here yeah this whole strip so like the you can see you know, on both sides you have a lot of the solar panels um, thank you lug bulk because the it, it sets again we wanted the building to feel like it had a bit of structure to it and um, you can see here it, it's another like um, has a crate and um, moving around so like the, we have the ramen shop and then we have another um, you can guess what upstairs might be. Um, and assembly, and you can kind of see that, th that there's implied um, inside where um, the crates are going in and out and you're stacking. And even like the back walls, all of them is the, the idea is like all the inside is massive storage for all these containers coming in and out. Um, and then on the far side, there is a hydroponics plant because people have to eat. The, one of the things that I should also mention um, Victor Eclipse Graphics. I don't know if people mentioned. There's a lot of um, products that he has personally designed specifically for this. He saw what we're doing and he got excited. And if you follow him and you see some of the latest releases, it's very, very cyberpunky. And like you can see, like some of the geishas here, a lot of the panels, a lot of it was done by him and is absolutely fantastic. Victor is the best. We love everything he does. Yeah, so like the, uh, you see these do not enter caution, like all of this is Victor. Uh, we, we worked with him and it's been fantastic. Despite that, one of the things I've always wanted him to do was the trauma team from uh, the game Cyberpunk 77. He hasn't done it yet, so I just like, okay, I'm just gonna build my own. Um, but uh, Victor, uh, jokes aside, is absolutely phenomenal and has supported us so much from day one, much like all the other folks. So moving down to this bottom layer, 
uh, Luke, who flew from uh, UK, he created this um, kind of uh, drone mecha uh, repair section. Um, and it, he, we had to ship him a lot of the parts because the, not a lot of, the, he's more of like a, a figure guy, which is great. But like, again, we tried to get anyone and everyone whatever they needed. So there was a lot of part shipping around. Um, and then in the middle here, Riley, I think Riley might win on the best part usage. So in there is a Bionicle mask that works as a, a, a door in, on the inside. It really is like the perfect scale when you look at the minifigs next to that. Yes, exactly. Um, and it's, it's just, I could not believe it. It's just like, okay, like no way this is going to work. And, and, and it worked. And like the, this is just a common trend of the, the talent that we have to put everything in there. Uh, moving on the far left side, Scotty, um, he unfortunately couldn't come, but again, he sent it with the rest of the crew, and he works actually as a, a machine shop in um, California. So like the, he, he needed to basically recreate, and like of all people, he actually would know what some of this dock stuff looks like because um, he, 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 this is what he does all the time. Like the, um, he even like we send some. We have like a whole channels of pictures of inspirational things. Like the all right, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do this. This looks right. This doesn't look right. I think one th last thing that I should mention that is not seen, but again, it's like we build a lot I think, I think I'm gonna go so that it all makes sense. And even though that it's not seen or it's not that visible, it's still an important part. Like the, you can see like, again, there's like a whole hazmat scene in there with black UV light and, and it's so not visible. But like one of the major components of this was the wall section between uh, inner or docks and inner city. So if you see in here, there's a giant wall here. Um, and, but it got so packed Again, we, we, re we reconfigured the uh, layout. Originally, there was going to be a lot more wall space, but now it's almost like it, it's hidden, but it's still there. Again, it just adds to that. And then right here, um, Finn, he um, was very busy, as well as he, he doesn't have a lot of bricks. So like the, he digitally designed our logo. Uh, Adam made the order, and we put it on site, and a lot of people, like if you notice, and matches the, our, our actual um, logo, which we actually got a guy on Fixer to design this for us and design the logo and the, all, all those assets. Yeah. But again, it's just one of these great collaborative efforts where everyone helps everyone do it. And it's just, it, it, it sort of, I, I'm honestly a loss at the world. I, I, I've done a lot of collabs. I've done a lot of things, but like really this is, one of the most incredible things I think I'll ever see. Anyways. Yeah, so back on to, that yeah. note, this is one of the most incredible things I ever see. There's a lot of stories in this build, a lot of people who gave 100% and over 100%, and, and I wanted to be sure, it's on the record, that no one committed as hard as Simon committed. He called in every favor, every goodwill that he's built in the community. It's the effort that Simon put into this and the belief in it. You know, I, I started the new Hashima project, but Simon is part of the original Brolog guys. Without that build, it wouldn't be here. Without Simon calling in every friend he had, calling in every favor he had, building with an intensity I have never seen. This, this model would not be here without Simon. I mean, this is built on the backs of tons and tons of people and tons and tons of effort and man hours. Estimated over a thousand hours just this week, assembling it for these two days. And uh, it just insanity, like I said, it's built on all of those backs, but nobody's bearing more weight in this build than Simon. It, it, it's um, the achievement of a lifetime, um, and, uh, and we should all be so proud, and I'm so proud of everyone, but nobody more than Simon. Incredible work, Simon. And not only building, but also thank you for taking all the time to take us through so much of this. I don't even know how long we've been going for now, but it's incredible as you take us through every level and all those details there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. No we'll keep moving around then to the next section here. How are we doing? Uh, I'm great. This is incredible. <laughs> I mean, I'm loving take it. I a nap between the next one. I'm ready for four hours more. Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> so we're going. Newishima does not, you know, it shows up. 
But hey, we're back in the inner city, so you can see the other corner. I designed the inner city, um, the layout, um, and how the connections would all work in the inner city very purposefully. I wanted to break this collab away from the standard collab where it's rectangular structure. And there was, a, I was thinking when we were expanding from 08, which we started with, how can we differentiate, how can we expand, but differentiate the build from a standard collab and, and elevate it? Um, in, in my idea, and it's worked out just perfectly. I can't, I'm so happy about it. Um, with the triangular shape, to get this irregular shape, um, to, um, to get more viewing angles for the public and for the AFOLs who are here. We went through some proposals. Uh, a lot of this was like a lot of back and forth with a lot of our talented builders here uh, of layouts. I had a very irregular layout, but uh, you know, it, there, we had a, a mission of um, openness. No one was above it, criticisms. Everyone was bringing 100%. Anyone could speak their mind about a build. Um, and, and, and we just nailed that aspect of it. Uh, the team, uh, I'm so proud of how they did it and how they approached the build. And, and, um, and, and the layout is just part of that. It, it developed over time with us working together. And ultimately, we landed on this layout. And, and I couldn't be more proud. There's something about the Bro Lug group. I know this is our like ode to the 2013 build from Bro Lug. Uh, um, when I started the project four years ago, uh, I didn't just want to copy the them. Uh, I, I had to think of a way to to make my version better and that that build in my opinion is a perfect build but one way that I thought I could improve it was to really think through the infrastructure and how the different um, sectors and roadways me uh, it's part of me like I want you to be able to look at the build and see a spot and be able to work out in your head how a minifig would travel to and from each spot and there be a logic to it. And that was how I decided very early on how I was going to differentiate New Hashima from the Brolug. Again, so much thank to the original Brolug members. Without them, without a lot of people, this just not wouldn't be here. But especially the old Brolug guys. We, I think we have three of the original 2013 guys. And, and it is... Uh, like my dream come true to be collaborating with those guys. If you would have told me uh, four years ago that we would be here, I would have said you were lying. It, it's it's incredible um, the opportunity we've had and how everybody came together. Just and the legendary builders that we're getting to collaborate with has just been insane. And and, uh, and I'm so happy and so thrilled about it. But anyway, I could ramble on and on and on about how happy I am. I'm gonna bring in uh, Dan to talk about his. Green Tower right here. Dan really showed up. Uh, he, he uh, I recruited him early on from Brick Fair, Virginia. He was next to us during that display with the fabulous Ninjago city that he built and uh, was super excited about it there. So I reached out to him while we were gathering people because he had the right mindset to come in. And man, Dan really showed up and just, just all out helping whatever job it was no job too small for dan no job too big for dan he really killed it getting us set up and i'm going to let him talk about his topper in inner city fantastic here we go thank you for the kind words Stefan. Yeah. so hello everyone my name is daniel zimmerman i also go by taco bricks online and i had the great honor of being part of this fantastic collaboration so as you see here as Stefan mentioned i did this sand green or green tower right here with the yellow triangle on it. And that yellow triangle, if you are a LEGO super fan, you'll probably recognize it from the LEGO CMF line. I believe it was Series 22 with the uh, super robot guy character. So he had that uh, logo printed on a one by one tile. And I had a couple that I had it sitting on my desk. And it got me thinking, I have a bunch of sand green parts. Why don't I make a, a sand green tower going off of that part? So I actually, there's a couple of them hidden towards the bottom of the tower, and I just kind of built up, added a whole bunch of greebling piping. I really wanted to give it that really industrial look, uh, a lot of texture, and make it really feel that cyberpunk vibe. 
and this is really a mock, um, my first time really doing lighting this extreme, so I wanted to add some light to the back of the logo too after making a big one. So I'm very, very proud of that tower. I'm very happy with how it came out. And if you saw it on the other side earlier, you noticed that one side slanted in two. That's actually just loosely kind of hanging in there. It's not connected on any studs. I tried to, but it, really, it was actually harder to connect on studs. And it was just, it actually sat better just sitting there loosely. So I just left it like that and it worked. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. And under that tower, you'll see a orange cube with these blue lights, uh, tube lights going through it. I also did that cube there. And as I was building the sand green tower, you'll notice in the windows, I have a bunch of translucent uh, light blue one by two bricks to kind of fill in the windows because there's nothing inside. It's just hollow structure um, just to kind of quickly build it up. And so as I was digging through my parts, finding the, the one by two bricks, I found the two by two round bricks. I'm like, you know what, these would be kind of cool for like a factory kind of power coil sort of look. And so I, as I'm sorting through, I'm pulling them out, pulling them out and I realized the tube lights we had fit through um, those bricks perfectly. So I just kind of weaved them through and put it in there. I'm like, well, make it like a sort of factory design. And I'm very happy with how that one came out as well. Um, and I did two more towers here. They're a little hard to see because as, as there's so many, so many awesome contributions to this build. Um, <laughs> it's like an actual city. Some things get lost in it, which I think kind of adds to the whole amazing detail of it. So around here, you'll see a white and light gray building that says Nintendo on the top. And that, that one's also mine. And I just kind of wanted to do a more kind of clean, curvy looking building that has a lot of nice curves on the front and undersides of it. Just make a really nice design, I guess. I really don't know what else to say about it. I just wanted to make a really clean building. Because the inner city, or story of New Hoshima, the inner city is supposed to be the more newer part of the city. It's supposed to be a little cleaner, more high rise style building. So I wanted to have something that was a little worn, but also it looked like it was newer had a more nicer feel, like maybe some people with a lot more money uh, live there and stuff like that. And under, I also did a cube that has um, some blue buildings and a garden underneath it, just to add a bit more life into this sort of almost no plant life city. There's a lot more dead plants and there's almost a bit more of kind of preserved uh, life in this almost cement jungle, I guess. So but yeah, I had a fantastic time contributing to this build. I'm so honored that Stefan invited me to be a part of such a wonderful build. Um, and I'm super proud of the work that we did. I'm super proud for Stefan for bringing us together. I'm super proud for everyone who is giving it their all. It's just really fantastic. And this is going to be something I remember for the rest of my life because of how amazing it is. So, of course, I'm not the only builder, as we mentioned, I'm not the only builder who contributed to this. So I'm going to pass it on to the next person here, Mason. Mason did some amazing towers that are also in the inner city, and I'm going to let him tell you all about it because he did it, I didn't do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Mason. Hey, I'm Mason. I am. My Instagram name is uh, msoccer2, um, and I was one of the, I guess, the admins of the of helping coordinate the inner city and and kind of getting things set up and telling people what to do and. I even run our official New Hashima collab Instagram page. So if you haven't followed that, quick shout out. Um, we put, repost everything that, that we've been doing here, our setup, our teardown, um, just the world of lights, you name it. But getting into the build here, uh, we'll start kind of on the corner. Um, on the bottom here, this is a a, a very, very hyper detailed cube from his name's Lauren Pinecone Eagle Man on Instagram, I believe. Um, you kind of have all sorts of stuff going on. You got the bonsai trees, some printed um, Eclipse graphics parts there um, for, for ramen. You got pipes going everywhere. You have people eating some kind of translucent orange soup with chopsticks. Uh, I don't know how that's possible, but um, Lauren was actually one of like the the people that had some of the best parts usage um, throughout his his build. So uh, just kind of pointing some things out, like these little uh, stud with a a clip. He used that as like an, a little awning. Um, let's see here, what else do we have? You know, we 
we have I think a lot of it's on the other side but you know we've we've got a little like store down here a cafe um, some apartment buildings and it just really came together c to support this massive tower right here um, so this is was made by one of the original bro lug members Carter um, he asked me to uh, kind of just uh, talk about it a little bit for him but uh, if you kind of go around the bottom section here, we have like ramen shops and, you know, just a bustling life and uh, very abundant, diverse characters throughout the whole thing. And um, we actually, the way that it was designed was that there's um, stairs on the side and they actually go up into the structure and you can see the kind of little pathways that that they would take up into this tower, which turns out is a, an apartment building. Um, so, you know, kind of as we go up, one of the, the things we like to say to make things cyberpunk is add AC units, add uh, pipes and little antenna, antenna arrays and signs, and then you've got a cyberpunk city, basically. Um, kind of a fun fact about how this was transported is this came all the way from Europe in one suitcase so every single side panel that you see all the details all removable and tetris like to the max in one suitcase so like all these are very thin panels but there's structure inside to kind of brace the the different walls together and then the fun part is just adding the various pipes and cords and wires and stuff um, you know, kind of as we go up, you know, you see various lights, um, like the the landing pad up here that has a kind of the Blade Runner spinner, um, a custom design for that. Um, and we have, you know, a lit up sign for AO5. I'm not really, sh I can't really remember what the reasoning for, for that specific uh, uh, signage was, but... It looks cool. There's a lot of lore here. <laughs> a lot of lore. I wasn't filled in on a lot of it, but <laughs> I could do my best. Uh, so, like, probably what we would think about is, like, we've got, like, some kind of control tower up there because you see, like, the, the very old red lattice bricks. There's probably 20, 30 of them just on that little tower array alone uh, with all the different, you know, radar dishes and... Um, the old giant gray lattice pe lattice pieces that were used, I think, in uh, I don't know. It's so many, so many various pieces that 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 were used here, and uh, kind of a shout out to the old Scala panels here. Um, we have like this salmon color, and then like a on the other side is like kind of like a pastel pink. Um, so. I guess kind of moving on a little bit, um, maybe we can come down towards the, the the road here. Is I built this little Akira bike and some some of the some of the gang, um, and we've got just various like cars spread throughout. And we actually have a a kind of tunnel uh, for the train that's in inner city, which they'll talk a little bit more about that. But as you can see, we kind of have like these little robot dogs. We had one member of the group, his name's Luke um, Blade Junkie, a shout out to him. He was very generous and he made a, one of these for every single member of the, uh, of the whole collab. And he kind of framed it as like, hey, I want you all to adopt uh, a robot dog. So we went in and everyone kind of picked one and then we kind of have just populated the entire uh, display with, with our little robot dogs. Um, this little uh, speeder right here, I made that as well. Just a little, very simple, probably only about 30 pieces. Um, just a little cube speeder, and we've got more speeders spread throughout, but, um, you know, we've got a whole little police uh, entourage right here for uh, watching the, the show and kind of patrolling outside of this uh, very risque kind of adult nightlife type uh, couple cubes here um, 
Now this this bottom cube right here, this was actually shipped to to one of our members, but that was made by Josh. His Instagram or his yeah, his Instagram handle is Building After Dark. Um, Josh is probably I think one of the only people to have made something for every single section, and so. He's got a, a special uh, role in this entire collab, and he's been very active, very good at giving criticism, very, very. Uh, that's he's, he gives a lot of memes and uh, just kind of brings a lot of life and humor into the group, which you know we we love to uh, have fun in, in New Hashima. Memes are the bedrock of all good collaborations. Yes. So it, it was probably mentioned somewhere else, but we had this kind of, uh, running joke that, it, in the Incredibles, Edna mode, she says, no capes. Instead, we changed it to no mechs, <laughs> but somehow some, some mechs kind of, kind of made their way into the city. But, um, so things like that, like we, we kind of kept the, the group fun and kind of, um, entertained throughout the, the kind of duration and the planning and the building of this, this whole collab. Um, so kind of moving up this, this cube stack here is Riley, Dr. Orange. Um, he made this kind of like flashing nightclub type deal. Um, very packed. There's, you know, little gangs here and there. You can kind of see kind of the um, some figures doubling up like they're, um, you know, kind of patrolling the area or, or whatever. But you, you can kind of see some, some old, like, Belleville um, lattice parts. And, you know, just kind of we wanted to create some kind of uh, cohesion between some of the, the, um, the cubes, uh, as you've kind of seen throughout the whole city. Um, so kind of moving up, this... Next cube is from Jan uh, Jastabrick on uh, Instagram and I think Flickr. And um, he came all the way from Switzerland, I believe, um, and made this beautiful octan like refueling station. And um, he's got this ship on the on the dock here is is one of his as well. And some kind of um, details in here is we've got like kind of the little Star Wars droids from the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. They got little hard hats on. You have like a service desk and um, some refueling stations, some, a guy eating a donut. And then my, probably one of my favorite parts in the whole collab, I just love small little details, is right inside the hangar bay there, he's got racks of just um, octane fuel canisters. And it's just, it's a subtle detail but it looks very clean, and um, I don't know. I just I just like it. <laughs> um, and then another shout out: these screens are all provided by Brick Stuff. He was very generous um, in kind of sponsoring this collab. Like every screen that you see, minus like maybe one or two that Stefan actually rigged up himself, are from and donated by Brick Stuff. So. Thank you again. We cannot thank you enough for kind of helping bring even more visual interest to the city. Um, and then the last cube here on the top is from El Barto Bart. Um, he made the uh, this kind of cybernetic dentist. Um, so you can kind of if the giant teeth outside of the the building weren't enough uh, indication of what this is. Uh, you can see people being worked on inside of the um, the the cube itself, um, and then the I forget exactly where the window pieces are, but it's not a normal like you know one by five by or one by six by five panel. Those are special um, bits that fit in between those columns. Um, so. Uh, kind of an, another nice parts usage there. Um, and then on the top, we actually, you know, you can never, you can plan as much as you, you can, but sometimes a few things kind of maybe fall through the cracks. And we didn't have a topper for, for this cube stack right here. So we had bulk bins, and we just kind of got to work and started making, like, fun little 
antenna arrays and and just kind of a platform to like a blank canvas to um, kind of start populating with things. And you know, we have so many floating, sh flying ships that this was the perfect spot to put one of these these fun uh, these fun vehicles. Um, kind of moving back down here, um, it's. I got a shout out to the Rebola guys. This is uh, made by Joe J and J Bricks. Uh, we have a meme in the group. Don't know how it started. Nobody does, but we all are obsessed with shirtless Woody. Um, he's probably spread throughout the city. Uh, who knows? He, people people hit him somewhere. But when the idea for New Hashima kind of came about, we wanted Shirtless Woody in in some capacity. So we're like, what if uh, we made a hologram Shirtless Woody? And Joe got right to work and made this super cursed, um, staring at you into your soul at all times if you come on this side of the display uh, and just kind of nuzzled him right back in there. I mean, the original idea was like, uh, a lot of our inspiration came from Blade Runner 2049, so um, forget the name exactly of, of the hologram girl that you see like out from the balcony, but w that was the kind of vibe we were going for uh, with Shirtless Woody, except, you know, he's Shirtless Woody. <laughs> so kind of moving, uh, moving further further down the, the, uh, the, the side of the inner city, this entire tower was mine. Um, so I, I was, like I said, I was one of the kind of uh, admins that helped coordinate inner city. And I said, I want to go big, because if we're going to do New Hashima, I want to build as big as I can. Um, so I originally started out with kind of like a very brutalist type architecture for the base, because if the tower is going to be tall, I needed something to support it. So I started out with just um, this light bluish gray, and I just kept adding. And then on the other side, you can't really see it from here. There's like um, an entrance to kind of go down into where the train station is. Um, just more lore. <laughs> um, and then, because I knew that I wanted to populate both sides with cubes, I kind of made it so, or made the tower in a way that things could just be pushed up right against it. Um, so I didn't have to worry too much about details on the sides, uh, at least on the bottom. And um, it's the way I kind of went about making this tower was I kind of had a lot of ideas, um, small bits of free time here and there. So I'd make a module here, I would make a module there, and then I needed to figure out how exactly it was all going to fit together. So I made like little adapters to... Uh, fill gaps and um, there's like a staircase on the other side with a whole atar entire apartment building like this side that's kind of a little blocked a little bit by the by the cubes there's like a whole um, like piping network that goes all the way to the top and we have those old like kind of like I think they're rock raider type parts we made like I made a vent that um, would uh, kind of the, the lore is that the, the mist from the, the bathhouse on top, um, right on the corner up here, would kind of vent out of that, um, that area. Um, kind of coming around the, uh, the, the build a little bit, this whole section was, is an, in con or an under construction uh, casino. So uh, I was kind of coming up with some names uh, just brainstorming, and I came up with the triple seven. Uh, I feel like that's kind of fits the casino vibe a little bit, and that's what the uh, um, the Japanese signage on the on the outside. It's kind of weathered a little bit. Um, it says the triple seven in katakana. I believe is the the correct um, pronunciation of the of the language. Um, but as you keep going up, you know, there's, there's, there's so much, but we have like a little rooftop party going on and uh, just like a bunch of high class you know, citizens, um, you know, more pipes, more signage. And then on the top, probably the, one of the most sketchy parts going up on like during the setup 
Uh, I'm a big Studio Ghibli fan, and I knew I wanted to do something Studio Ghibli for the build, or at least cyberpunkify it in some ways. So I wanted, I made the part of the bathhouse from Spirited Away, um, and you kind of have like hundreds of small two by two brown windows and like a hundred of those Ninjago um, like white panels, uh, like door panels. Um, and I have, I made a, like a Yakuza gang that they're kind of all patrolling around the, uh, the owner of the bathhouse, which just so happens to be me. <laughs> He's perched up there on the, uh, the, the kind of gold balcony. Um, so he's got a lot of henchmen, a lot of, a lot of bodyguards, and all of his advisors are up there. They're making business deals. They're um, doing some, some shady business. Um, and one final thing on the, on the top is we, I got those um, kind of, I wouldn't say, they're, I think they were used in like a bridge or something. I just kind of inverted them and made like just kind of a whole like support tower array. I posted that and the next thing I know, Ben, who you probably already talked to on the other side, he, his tower array is a, a foot taller than mine. <laughs> so we, we kind of had that, that running joke going back and forth and then all of a sudden Simon brings his monstrosity of a, of a tower, uh, an antenna array on top of his tower. So I just kind of kind of reserve myself to like this is it I'm I'm happy with uh, with how it came out we just have like a, a little kind of church on top and just lots of figs just kind of scattered around and um, we'll talk more maybe on the other side uh, once we get around to it but um, I think that is that is it for for this side of the uh, of the of the build, and I'm gonna pass it off to Stefan, who's going to introduce Mike uh, with the old city. Mason stepped it up, took on an admin role very early, committed 110 percent. Again, I said Simon bore the brunt of all the weight, but Mason really did had you know lots of stuff happening in his life during the process of the 10 months that we were planning this too, and and, and never backed down for a moment. You know, he had distractions and, and he had every excuse to step down and, and, or step out or slow down and he never did and Mason did a tremendous effort and he should be very proud of the effort he put in. Another person who should be very, very proud of the effort they put in, an OG bro log member building for tons of years in, uh, and, and a huge part of New Hashima, Michael Wilhoyt, who's going to take you through Old City. And I know his guys are super excited to talk about it. Uh, Mike, thank you, my man. You did. You also, you know, did an amazing job and bore a lot of this weight. And I'm. And you take it away, my man. All right. Well, uh, thank you for having me, guys. Uh, we're gonna take you through Old City. So, we're gonna start this out by talking about like a little bit of the lore of it. We wanted this side of the city to be a little bit more, um, I guess, like grungy in a way. And so. Uh, you start out like moving through this train tunnel or a walkway into like a decent part of these small islands and the train stops you can get off of this like decently modern luxury apartment area like up on the top floor but it gets skeezy as you go down there's an abandoned mall on the side here uh, as well as like uh, just some like stuff going on I guess uh, the train then moves around the track to this weird pagoda shanty town and then over to the large island full of just like the seediest stuff possible. So like, that's an overview. Uh, the lore was very much inspired by like a melding of just like all kinds of stuff. It's like the oldest part of the city. It's been here for decades and just anything can happen here. We have like a fiber optic cable running to the big tower. We got dudes fighting on it. You'll see a bit later. But uh, to start it off, I'm going to introduce Cam here and they're going to talk about uh, their builds, uh, our other collaborator Joseph's builds, and some people who couldn't be here as well. So Cam, take it away. Hey, how's it going? Fantastic. I love that we're, we're launching into a whole new section. Even though we've been here like two hours already, there's you know, still so wild. much more. <laughs> there, yeah, there's, there's truly so much to explore in this city. Um, and the city we're in, or sector that we're in right now is the old city, Sector 4. Uh, so Michael here was kind of the showrunner behind this sector. Um, kind of the idea behind this 
part of the city as this is the more decrepit, kind of more neglected part of the city. We've got a uh, neglected, neglected infrastructure, like we've got this train that's just barely chugging along. Um, we've got uh, this incredible uh, decomposing mall that uh, Papa Bricolini, Josh, put together and uh, sent out here. Sadly, could not be with us here today. Rip. What are some of the details, maybe parts in there that you can point out? Because there's a lot happening there. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, I mean, like the old school palm tree is just like iconic. And I think like the colors here are very reminiscent of like classic Paradisa uh, and like you know, 80s mall architecture. This like shade of green, I don't think even exists anymore and is very, very hard to find. Um, yeah, the we've got uh, like these, these cases here being transported. We've got someone chilling out here on the mattress. Got a people, couple people passed out. They're best friends. They love each other a lot. We all love each other a lot here in this build. Um, yeah, very, very good work. And I, I love this dolphin so much. It's just like perfect, like kind of cyberpunk vaporwave sort of vibes. Almost makes me think of like Johnny Monomic. Um, but yeah. Wonderful. So what else did you work on here? Yeah, so uh, my contributions to the build are this little cyberpunk cafe uh, slash body mod shop. So down here we've got the coffee shop, got some folks in line. This dog is begging for attention. You know, he's been out with his owner for a while and is feeling a little neglected. Um, got my Sig Fig right here, drinking a nice cup of hot black coffee. Um, and if you take a look inside, you can see there's some detail in there as well. Got a little takeout window. Um, and I've uh, put in some EL wire to get kind of a steam effect for the coffee logo. Um, and Inside on this side, we've got stairs that go up to the Ripper Dock, uh, the body mod shop, and uh, may not be able to see it in there super, super well, but someone's getting some work done. Got someone who just got his little ocular implants done is on his way out. Um, up here, we've got a rooftop garden uh, where this this fine person is, is uh, hanging out, making do with whatever little plants that they can. Um, got a little frog hanging out in there. You got to have a frog in your build. That's like rule number one. Um, we got the uh, the 7G tower, you know, just blasting data into the minds of everyone in New Hashima, connecting to our, our main 7G network. Um, and then uh, another part of my build that I'm sure will be covered later is I've got a tower uh, in the inner city here. Um, but yeah. Joshua, who is uh, also part of Charm City Lug, um, uh, has built this like kind of double cube, which I think this is the only like double wide cube in the entire display today. Um, so we've got these apartments. I think he did such an incredible job with these like silhouettes here. It's it just adds so much like depth and story to uh, to the build. Um, Zach did this amazing blimp up here with uh, what I assume is the blimp driver pilot being kicked out. Um, that or perhaps someone who's uh, tried to hitch a ride illegally. Uh, Some of this is a choose your own adventure type of thing. You know, you know, viewers can decide what, what might be happening here. <laughs> this is completely true. There, there are so many stories if you just look for them um, and so many stories that you could tell on your own. Another one of my very favorite details in this entire in this entire section is this TV stack here that Joshua did. Um, just so great. Great cyberpunk vibes. Fantastic. Awesome work. Thank you. Passing it back over here. Uh, Cam is taking you through the uh, closest part of Old City to the inner city. The most is happening there. There's a train stop. There's like decent shopping. There's like fun walkway stuff to do. And then you hop from this station in the middle here and you head down to the seedy part of town. We got, first of all, sh big shout out to legendary members Zach Bean, Bugatti Beansis, and Ben Lefke for helping him out because uh, Zach made this whole pagoda and shanty town along the train tracks here, came to us in pieces, and we just had uh, Ben Lefke come and like reconfigure the entire thing to this amazing like slum section. Uh, my favorite part of this, honestly, is uh, 
Oh, there it goes. Uh, my favorite part of this, honestly, is how we were, as we were running out of parts, um, Ben just took this yellow thing, this yellow box right here, and put it on a bunch of cloth pieces and just let it ride. <laughs> um, this is, it just keeps sagging. It just keeps going deeper and deeper. And the best part about it is that this noodle shop, still open for business. They're still going. Those noodles are amazing. Best noodles in Old City. Um, we really love this view in here of all the trains running around because like, even though it is a cyberpunk dystopia, uh, it has better mass transit than most cities in the US. We got like three monorails running at any given time. We got a big train going in and out of the city. We got, we got walkable uh, bridges over here. We got boats, we got everything you need. I'm here. jealous of their options, honestly. And best part of all, no cars here. Completely walkable city. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to the jungle, the real seedy part of town. We got like this first train stop here. Your first stop is boobs, right down below there. We got the strip clubs train station. We got a busted car down here. And we got uh, this lovely uh, kind of Middle Eastern Egyptian inspired tower. From bottom to top, it's an amazing entrance into the city. Bottom was our, our friend who could not be here again, uh, Jack Spittler, Thug Lug Original. And then we got Tobias Whalen with the middle cube in the top tower. Uh, Tobias dropped all this stuff off of my apartment a couple days ago, and I just like let it ride all the way over here. This top tower is so intriguing with those unique color combinations there, and of course, kind of the dome on top really kind of stands out from a lot of the other stuff around it. Yeah, so like, I mean, one big inspiration for us is like we wanted to take cyberpunk in a bit more of a uh, like a Middle Eastern direction, just because that's not something that's been done before. So uh, a lot of it was very much inspired by like my travels to Istanbul, Tobias's travels to like the Mediterranean, as well as just like a lot of concept art and interesting stuff we've seen from like Cairo, uh, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Beirut, a lot of different places across the world that came together to uh, create this like unique vibe for the city. This this minifig I want to point out is absolutely fantastic. There's so much happening there with that one fig. Oh yeah, he that's the general. Um, <laughs> He, he calls the shots, it's the general. Um, and so we move over to this corner lot here. Uh, and this beautiful corner cube on the most prominent corner of the old city, facing the public, is another guy who showed up, built it, and then dipped, uh, Ryan Keith, another Thug Lug original. Uh, down here, we have like, after you get off the train at this uh, strip club station, you end up down at the monorail stop, and that takes you to the rest of the town. You can either go up to the pawn shop, and then walk through the town here, where you can go down to the lower level, where you got like your hookah lounges, your back alley surgery shops, your kebab stands, uh, and then also like up on the top here, we have the pawn shop, we have um, the high security checkpoint for the uh, black site. Uh, <laughs> comms company tower, I think we're gonna call it. Like, it's kind of everything. We got like little vignettes inside of here uh, with, with uh, lights courtesy of brick stuff um, with like computer wiring, torture. We got like domestic surveillance. We got everything here. Uh, and then up on top, of course, we have some pilots and a gunner uh, sharing a cigarette next to some high uh, octane jet fuel. Um, marvelous shot right there. So, um, a part of this is like all three of these cubes here, uh, Ryan's and my two right here, we all coordinated to make sure that the sidewalks lined up so it had this very contiguous feeling. Um, I'm going to let George in on a second, but I did an homage to our one other member who couldn't be here, uh, Nate Brill, Shabilulumas on Flickr. Uh, he built this amazing Salmon Scala Tower back in 2013, and uh, I had to pay tribute to that with a white Scala Tower and a uh, flashing neon sign that in Arabic says al-Burak, which means uh, lightning, it's a mythical creature, and then kibonetica in Hebrew. So it's a really multicultural mixing ground, and uh, we wanted to pay an homage to the OG. One last thing is this other sign here that I built is uh, uh, Jinmai Koma Inu, which is the uh, lion dogs of like Japanese and Chinese folklore and like Shintoism, where one has its mouth open and one has its mouth closed, showing the beginning and end of the universe. And we thought that that would make a great like gateway Easter egg into the rest of the city. So George is gonna come up next. He has been my, my colonel, my lieutenant, um, my, my soul brother, my good time guy uh, for ages. George Hawes, let it bang. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, 
So yeah, a big part of this section for us and in the planning, we really wanted it to feel like you can really move around through the entire city, get, get to every location on there. And that's kind of something, so I worked mostly on this section here, got some cubes down on the bottom, but really wanted to have a way to move from the, the bottom at the water. There's some stairs on the backside um, that come up to this first kind of landing that goes around. And you can see it from the other angle over there, but there's a rug shop that I built in there. We have, Michael and I are kind of collectors of all those fun Scala and Belleville cloth pieces, and I thought it'd be a fun way to use them. So much crazy, unique stuff that LEGO has done over the years like that. Absolutely, absolutely. We love finding that stuff and trying to find fun ways to use that. And then there's a little smoke shop here. Then that kind of comes around to this walkway, and then you can get up around. Um, and then Jackson did a great job down here in this cube. There's a little train station for the monorail. Um, and that's something we added as well. I'm not sure if Michael talked about the graffiti that we put on his train, but we had one of our um, friends from Thug Lug, Ben Lefke. He did some graffiti, and we actually got it cut out and put on his train. Um, I tried to be a little more purist with mine, but I got um, all kind of Lego graffiti stickers on there to make it feel more natural like it's in the old city. Um, and then on the back side of this, there's an Oakley store. Uh, Michael and I are both big Oakley fans. So I, I unfortunately didn't wear my shoes to match Michael today, but um, we've got that going on. And then on the back side, you'll see again, I did a lot of ads for this topper here um, with the dragon. I, I started with, I'd, I'd gotten a bunch of the NBA stand plates through a yard sale. I think I got a huge bag for a dollar. And I was like, there's gotta be a fun way to use those on my topper. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration there. Um, and then the dragon was something I'd seen in Die Rise, the zombies map, um, that I wanted to build for a while. Um, designed digitally in studio and then kind of thought this would be the perfect place to put it. And so we've got ads all over. We've got the Scala guy down here with the, uh, the backing paper is from the Dream Star watch. Um, so it's still purist there. Um, we've got the Oakley store down on the bottom and he's wearing the same shades that are on the logo above the door. So he's selling it's an Oakley ad there. Yeah, looking for future looking sponsorship, for maybe? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And and the architecture of the Oakley store is based on their headquarters out in California. Um, and then Mike was saying he's got a plastic surgery sign uh, or um, shop down in his, so I added a plastic surgery sign on there, which you know got got a little double meaning there. Um, and then it's just like, yeah, sorry, 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 George. Uh, the entire back side of this thing is like hidden deep in this, but it like adds such a great effect of depth of like, you stand in this one window and just see like all the stuff that's just like hidden inside the city. You got like the, the kebab shop down in the corner there with the tobacco signs, the, the tobacco store sign, the Electrica uh, cybernetic enhancement station. We got like a laundromat in Jackson's cube. We got the Metro station. We got the Oakley store in George's cube. And we have La Real, which is Brian O'Leary's beautiful VR uh, hotel where you just jack in and like just let the, let the wires like take you into a different reality. So much to see and do. Absolutely, absolutely. And then for my rug shop, I thought it'd be perfect. So I, uh, the lettering on the back there is um, says rug in Japanese. So we've got that down there. Um, and then tried to add some lettering or, or some wiring to around some of the signs. So I found some clickets, necklaces, and, bracel uh, and bracelets. So you can see it around the Jaguar sign and around the uh, Speed Racer sign up there. There's some neon with the clickets. And then um, shout out to Ignacio Nacho. Ignacio Bernaldo is another Brolug OG, uh, Bro OG for the camel sign. The, uh, the smoking camel there is, uh, you'll see it on a Flickr photo. He did the same advertisement of a camel smoking a cigarette. This uh, whole part of town back here, too, is like where you get all the stuff that you can't in the rest of the city. You get like your crazy tobacco shops, your mahjong parlors, your illegal enhancements, uh, your VR uh, hotels that you should not be going to. And you also get your, um, your digital surveillance. And uh, we have these two dudes in the middle, I guess maybe I didn't point out, uh, just doing a little anime sword fight around the fiber optic cable, uh, fighting for the fate of Old City. Uh, I think that really just about covers it for us. I guess one thing I forgot to mention, unless Cam did, is uh, our boy Lego Finn, his amazing contributions to the seawalls down here. Uh, he built like a little squid processing shop and uh, like a little shanty town with like a, a sewage drainage 
pipe, a sewer drainage pipe down there. So I guess if we can get in there just a little bit down below here, you got like Georgia's rug shop, you got like some dudes chilling out in, uh, in spheres, and you got like the lower highway full of like busted tiny trucks and stuff. So I want to thank George and I want to thank all of our boys. Let's head back around here. We have the whole crew for the old city. More and more details here. Yeah, so just real quick. This here is the whole crew. We got like Francis, Jackson, Brian, Aiden, George, Finn. These are all the members of the old city that came by. And of course, we got to shout out uh, uh, Jordan, Mason, and Riley for helping out with like various knickknacks and vehicles and stuff all over the city. And one last guy I got to shout out is Connor Lil for helping me finish up. Uh, this train track. Without his collection, that would not have been possible. That dude really like grinded out all these train bridge pieces. Insane. Like him and I like did half and half on it, but like without his like pillars and stuff, this train would not have been running. So that's the old city. Um, sh shout out to all the other people that aren't here. We got Braley, we got Zach Beam, we got Josh Papa Briccolini, we got Jack Spitler, Tobias Whalen, right, Ryan Keith. I think so many great builders. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. So uh, thanks for having us again. I guess we'll hand it back to Stefan now. Okay. Here we, here, here we go. <laughs> hey. oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> hey, it was <say> hi, <laughs> Finn. My son Finn here, uh, seeing the build on Father's Day. Proud pop I am. And, and uh, so next we have it in inner city, uh, Meredith and uh, Brian who came out too. Uh, who put a ton of effort into these towers that we have here in inner city. Um, we're so happy to have them. They were such a huge, huge help this week. And we have had a ton of people who just really, I mean, everybody gave 100%, and that's the people we were looking for. But Meredith and Brian really showed up and helped me out, watching out for me, bringing me lunch and dinner on the floor so that I could eat as fast as possible and keep building. And just really th so much thanks to them for this weekend. It's, it's been so special, and we're so happy to have them. But I'm going to let Meredith talk about her builds, okay? Well, I'm really just thankful to have be invited into it. But uh, we got a corner here of Inner City. Um, Mason asked if I'd talk you through maybe just a little bit of his part of the corner. Um, so we have the other half of the casino. Uh, we like to laugh because there's some hangul up there because we, you know, we're very international here. Um, and it actually, it was supposed to be casino, but apparently it's like sexy mattress or something. It's not, not right, but it's still fun. I love having all the languages. Um, we have this kind of aquarium going on here, and there are giant koi fish in there. Um, and then there's some cultists out front. They're a little weird and wacky, but that's part of the fun of, of cyberpunk. Um, but the favorite part of, for me of, of Mason's build is this beautiful garden that he has on top of the aquarium. And it just feels like it flows. And this is what really astonished me about the build is we had ideas of what we're building, but no one could say, well, well, mine's this high and mine's this, like we had footprints, but we had no idea what they would look like together or how they would mesh. And to me, this is magic. Like, you know, I didn't want to build super tall, but it fits so well and it allows it almost like to grow like a mountain behind it. Um, so Mason's garden is just phenomenal. Um, and I have this corner over here, I like to call it the friendly corner. I'm a big fan of Martin Harris. Um, and I love building in bright friends colors. So we kind of have all the friends colors in here, but again, it's, it's adapted to cyberpunk. Um, so we have a mall that's out here on the corner. Um, I love Azor, so we're in all the Azores. I try to give it kind of that 80s vibe where like, you know you watch an 80s movie and they're trying to be like, this is what the future would look like. This was like, if there was an 80s mall in the future, here's where it'd be. Um, so it's got a full in kind of interior with different um, little stores. It's not super fleshed out, but it definitely, you can see in there and there are people in there shopping. Um, we have a, a mean girl squad out front uh, with the tutus that are robbing people so they could go buy some more clothes. Um, my daughter made those figs. It was hilarious. Um, next door we have a purple bathhouse. Um, unfortunately, I got a little turned around when I was building this because again, we're all thinking we have Excel files with layouts. Okay, you're here, you're there, you're this layer. And so it's facing, the door is facing out into the inner plaza, but I still think it looks great. And then um, Mason had built that giant bathhouse. So we have bathhouse competition, but you know, 
people in New Hashima need to get clean. So, um, so I try to have that typical Japanese style bathhouse vibe. And then above that, I have kind of another token thing of, you know, when you go to Japan or Tokyo, it's a capsule hotel. It literally says capsule and pink on the side. Um, again, I, I found the dots, the dot set that had the picture holder clamp. That's what those parts are. Um, I thought they made a great kind of modern, brutalist um, texture out front. Um, luckily, no one likes those parts, so they were readily available on BrickLink and Volume. Um, and so I could get kind of get pink in there. Um, and then the top two items, we have uh, kind of like a, a mini corporate plaza. Um, I love teal, too. As you can see, I like color. Um, my dad worked for the state of New York, and if you've ever been to Albany, New York, and this, they have like these state buildings that were built in the 60s, gorgeous, gorgeous, mid-century modern, and they have this washed sandstone sides, and that's what I was trying to do. So I try to use a lot of uh, texture and white, and then I went in with aqua and, and teal to kind of give it like that rippled sandstone effect. Um, and then it's kind of just very brutal and minimalistic. My daughter's best friend told me it looked like a prison, and I said, that's awesome, because that's where I'm going for. Um, and then at the top, we used uh, an acronym for a wonderful cyberpunk movie from the 80s, uh, RoboCop. I needed an evil corporation, and I just couldn't put evil corporation. So it actually translates to the letter OCP, you know, the company that took over and built RoboCop. So that's, that's their new headquarters here. Um, and then next door, I was um, really inspired. I can't remember the artist's name, and I'm really feeling bad about that. He has a display in the Lego house. It's a beautiful pagoda with the tree, the tree dragon wrapping through. Um, I was really inspired by that. I kind of ripped off his, the, the builder's roofs. Um, and I said, I want to make that, but I want to make it look like it's not natural, because his was so, it was like all about beauty and nature coming together. And so this is like, OK, if we took that and we kind of made it unnatural, because this is a cyberpunk city, um, I used highlighter yellow. Um, which is reactive to UV. And shout out, I know you know Chris Giddens. Chris Giddens is working on a space, like little spaceships with a theme of highlighter yellow, and I stole that idea from him. Sorry, Chris. That um, color is just like so in your face when is, you look at it, it there. <laughs> but, you know, it, it gives you that feeling that, yes, this is beautiful, but it's not necessarily natural. Um, and then we kind of have that vertical gar garden underneath it to kind of be like a play on. Yes, we're trying to have nature. We're trying to have, you know, some very, you know, old ancient roots here in the city, but it's not really. It's kind of a facade. So that was kind of my 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 story for this corner. Um, you know, and again, just shout out to my husband. I am not a technic person, and these two toppers are very tall and narrow, um, and they have great. Te he made these great technic spines. They are completely stable. They won't fall over. They won't lean because, again, that teal building is all built on its side. It's all built on its sides. There's no studs up supporting it except for in the center. So shout out to my husband, my collaborator, my co-builder. So happy Father's Day tune too. Um, and then the last thing I'd love to point out is I love buildings. I, I think I'm a decent building builder, but this city would not come alive with all the carts and the cars and the kiosks and the minifig staging, which ever all these other builders have brought to it. And it just like my, I think they look good, but until you put these figs there, it, it just, it looks alive. So that's my little friendly corner of your city. I think Kevin um, is gonna talk to you about more of the skyline behind it. So let me get Kevin in here. Awesome work, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi there. Hello. So why don't you tell us your name and then what do you have here? Sure. My name's Kevin, aka Lego Revolution, and I was able to uh, contribute one of the toppers here in Inner City. So it's this white office building with these lab modules off to the side, and then there's a band of kind of 1960s apartments, kind of mid-level and below. And the concept here was to create something that's more of an old feel in the inner city because New Hashima is a very old city. And I wanted there to be like this 1960s-esque uh, feel for like the tower and its originality. And I was really inspired by uh, some of the older buildings where I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. So you see kind of this tile pattern, kind of this art deco uh, brick banding in the uh, haphazard uh, apartment levels and then you've kind of got like this uh, you know cast construction for the office tower above and the lab modules off to the side in yellow were meant to be kind of you know more this ominous feeling uh, you know get the cyberpunk new Hashima feel of uh, you know at some point in the future a uh, 
a uh, some sort of experimental lab like came in and occupied the tower and took over the side. So you got three lab modules there, and on top I used some clickets uh, containers as another type of lab module. Uh, so the research is occurring up there on the roof as well. Uh, the research is is ominous, of course. Uh, in the top lab module off to the side there is a a monkey with a robot arm and a hook escaping and that's a big shout out to Keith Goldman OG big inspiration to me back when I was uh, a, a little kid uh, building about 13 years ago so this is the first time I've built in 13 years uh, it's it's been a lot of fun I, I, I think the challenge was to prove to myself that I still could build and uh, I'm very excited that uh, Stefan and the rest of the group uh, accepted me in to, to include a build like this. Yeah. No, this is spectacular. So you've got this one section there with all the different colors and then lots of different elements. What are some of your favorite pieces that you were able to include in that part there? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, as I said, I haven't built in 13 years, so I had quite a bit of catching up to do on the color palette and, and new parts coming out. Um, the, the coral for the uh, video, uh, you know, containers, uh, those are supposed to be like apartment modules I wanted to include. And then we've got uh, a clickets panel above, kind of adding to that element of the module of the apartments there. And, and conceptually, the idea was that these, these kind of coral elements were going to be uh, an additional add-on to the, the textile brick apartments that were pre-existing. So at some point uh, in the future, or, or, or in the past, I guess, in this instance, uh, these apartments were added onto in, in the uh, in the building. Um, but another element that I really like is I've got some of the old UFO panels off to the side on the right there that form a, a green light well, like a cyber light well. Uh, I always loved the UFO sets when I was a little kid, so I wanted to pay homage to you know kind of those older pieces and and really create something that was unique and interesting. I figured that. Uh, uh, a cyber light well would be something that's like really cool that I would want to go experience in a, an apartment complex. Incredible work. Thank you so much for, for what you brought out here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Again, Kevin put in a tremendous effort getting his stuff back together. You know, accident, we knew accidents were going to happen and, and we were prepared for it and everybody brought 110%, Kevin included. You know, uh, it's tremendous how much like everybody was like, yes, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And we were here to succeed as a group and nobody was getting left behind from that group, including Kevin. And um, I know that uh, I have a ton of people to thank. Um, I'm not going to thank them all because it's just too many. But I wanted to specifically thank Victor at Eclipse Graphics. If it hasn't been said before, he's poured tons of love into this building, tons of love for the new Hashima group. Uh, and so a special thanks to him, Simon, Mason, everyone, Spaceballs. And, and it's just been tremendous. Uh, thanks to all of the families who've supported us, my family, my wife, who supported me through the whole four years. Um, it, it has been tremendous. My mom and, and parents who've been texting me or who are here, and, and just it, it's been great and I know all these guys have that exact same story and that exact same uh, network behind them and you know uh, this was very close to my final vision for the project um, but I, I just want to say on record that we aren't even close to done that we are going even bigger next time and you better no, buckle no, up no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no it's on record it's on record anyway uh, thanks so much Josh Oh, man. <laughs> That's the good stuff. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Josh. It's been awesome, my man. Thank you so much for everyone who took the time to take us through this whole way out here. This is incredible. I have no idea how long we've been going for here, but this is insane. Thank you for all the builders and all the effort you put in here. I, I can't, can't thank you enough. Hey, it's our pleasure. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.